uh, welcome everyone to this, um, uh, I don't know what we're calling it, webinar or RESC Halifax uh, uh, webcast of lunar observing tonight. And uh, we're, we're very pleased to see so many people participating. And uh, so what we have is we have Blair McDonald is set up in Bedford with his tel uh, telescope. He's back at the, he's back there. Hi, Blair. So um, he's got his telescope set up with a, um, a guide scope and uh, a, um, a main telescope with um, an imager, a camera. And so what we're going to do is take a little tour of the moon uh, tonight uh, with the telescope and camera. And we're going to pick out a few things uh, that are on the moon. And I chose the things. I mean, there's so much you could look at. I mean, you could spend all night doing it. But what I chose for tonight was to look at the objects in Explore the Moon, the RESC Observing Program, Explore the Moon, the ones that are uh, near or on the Terminator tonight, which is a, a very good lighting situation for viewing them. And we'll, we have, I think, about a couple of dozen things that we could uh, go and look at and um, but you know what's uh, that's not uh, cast in stone that was just to kind of get everyone started and if anybody would like to see a particular feature that they're interested in just uh, speak out and let us know um, now one thing uh, the other thing that's going to happen tonight is at some point uh, we're going to have a special guest Kathy LeBlanc from Acadia First Nation uh, she's my project partner in the Mi'kmaq Moons, and I asked her if she would participate. So she'll come along a little later, and she'll uh, tell us a little bit about the cultural significance of the moon time we're in. And I won't, I don't want to steal her thunder, but I will say that the moon time we're in is called the Frog Cro Croaking Moon, and uh, she'll have quite a bit to say about that when she comes on. But I told her we'd only let her talk for five minutes. <laughs> Anyway, she's, uh, when she's on, she's very on. But it'll be a fun to have her with us. So other than that, the other thing that we might have a peek at tonight, uh, we didn't push it or, or promote it in a big way because we weren't quite sure what we would be able to see. But tonight is uh, a night that we can look at the so-called Lunar X, which is, a, which is a feature near the Terminator or the moon where some high mountains and crater edges catch the light of the moon and create an X, a light X against a dark background. Uh, it happens pretty late here. It might be better in, in a part of the world that's farther west, but we'll maybe check in and see what that's doing uh, from time to time. You have to remember that uh, moonrise, sorry, sunrise on the moon uh, takes place 30 times slower than it does on Earth. I mean, you get a sunrise every day, and on the moon, it only rises every 30 days. So it's not a very fast thing when the sun rises on the moon. You, you could, uh, it's like watching paint dry to watch the sunrise on the moon. So having said all that as an introduction, again, welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Blair to pop in there now and tell us what the status of the telescope is. So it is uh, very, very roughly polar aligned. Uh, I only had two targets to align on, one being Venus and one being the moon. I will probably pop out again, uh, maybe when, uh, uh, maybe in a half an hour or so, just to refine the alignment a bit, and I will have to go out and focus now. So uh, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna share my screen so people can see the uh, view through the telescope, the live view at the moment and I'll go attempt to sharpen it up. The seeing is not great, and there are some bands of cloud moving through. They should move off here shortly. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, we should be able to see the moon. So bear with me and I'll try and share my screen. Uh, let's see, that should share the screen and you should be able to see the moon there now. Right. Okay, so Dave, if you want to, uh, chat for just a little bit with folks there. I'm going to uh, go out and attempt to sharpen that focus up if I can. The seeing is pretty bad. I guess I'm going to try to figure out what you're looking at there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one sec, I can zoom in just a little bit here. There we go. That's not my problem. 
<laughs> I'll be back in just a minute. Uh, yeah, so where's Blair? Uh, oh, still, still right here, Dave. Okay. Um, okay. So I, I'm going to pop out and focus, so I'll be back in just a minute. I just decided that I'm going to need to fire up another computer here so I can look at a, I can look at the moon atlas and look at your screen at the same time. F fair enough. Anyway, while we're doing this and getting ourselves organized, does anyone have any questions or comments they want to make at the moment um, about what we're doing? Don't be shy. And because I've muted y'all, um, you might want to unmute your um, speakers before you uh, ask questions, okay? Thank you. Dave, it's Quinn. Hi, Quinn. I can tell, I can tell that you're not really on the moon because of the direction of the shadows behind you. So um, huh. I'm, I'm very disappointed. I thought you were going to be on the moon. Well, I don't know. You, you really outed me here uh, because I'm not on the moon. I have to confess, I'm not on the moon. Um, I meant to go on the moon. Uh, there was, I was supposed to meet somebody there for dinner and uh, it got everything kind of got screwed up because I contacted my friend and he said, you know, we, we can't go for dinner. And I said, what, what's the problem? And he said, well, I, I chucked out the restaurant and, and I went there the other day for lunch and you know, it's okay, but I didn't think it would be a good place to have dinner tonight. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, you know, they, they've got great food, but there really is, there's no atmosphere. That was a good setup, Dave. <laughs> ha -ha, ha -ha, from Wolfville. Ha -ha. Awesome. Uh, uh, well, uh, th thank you, Quinn. <laughs> oh, boy. And You're I welcome. can spoil it for you this time, Dave. I am so glad I was out focusing while he said that. <laughs> okay, we have a little better focused version of that image there now. Um, so here is where we are on the lunar surface, Dave. You take a look there. I can move around now in whichever direction you would prefer. Okay, I'm just getting myself organized here. Uh, okay, where are we on the moon? Uh, okay, I think, okay, I think if you move the cursor a little bit down and to the right. There. Can you go there? I can go there. Give me just a minute. Okay. Hello. I'm getting there. Bear with me. I just got to get the direction <laughs> sorted out. Uh, down, all around. Is the bigger one there a Stoffler? Oh, come on, Tony. I'm guessing. Well, he could stop there. That one there on the, uh, on the Terminator. Um, um, so, so, Blair, can we take a picture now? Can we take a picture uh, of that? Uh, we, we should be able to. Uh, bear with me. I'm just going to get some loose. I'm or can we, can, can we, can we um, suppress the... Uh, oh, okay, that's better. That there, uh, that was Tony Schellink, who's, uh, he's, he's trying to take over my title of lunar, uh, lunatic. Uh, that is Stoffler, the one that's on the Terminator, right on the middle there. And it's got a, a number of um, secondary craters within it. The one I was going for was the one that was, is a little bit to the up, upper uh, left. That one there, and that's the one. That one there is um, in the Explorer of the Moon, uh, and it's called um, Marolicus. Marolicus, and if it was flipped the other way, it would look like sort of a Mickey Mouse head, with a, a crater with two ears, and it's got a central peak. So that's one of the uh, craters in the Explorer of the Moon, Marolicus. It's on our list for tonight. Um, so if we go over to the Terminator, 
uh, and move up, move up along the terminator um, uh, player. There's a pair of craters in the upper right. Maybe we can center those. So you can see the image is, is kind of waving around, wobbling as if you're looking through uh, a water. That's the that's what we call seeing or the lack of it. That's a, it, it, and you see this in the telescope visually too, not just in the. Um, okay, there we go. There's the, that's nice. That's a very good. So we just move that, inch that over to the center. That pair of craters that are in mostly in shadow. So that the, the wobbly view here that we're seeing through the telescope is what we call poor seeing. Uh, that's what, when Blair said it was poor seeing, that's that wobbly look. Uh, it's, uh, it, it really makes taking photographs hard, but your eye can actually follow that. So that's not really super bad for um, the eye. Now, those two craters there, uh, they're not in Explore the Moon, but I'll tell you I'll tell you why they're important. The one on the left is called Aliensis, and the one on the left is called Werner. And you can see that it's not fully illuminated. All you can see is about um, two thirds of the rim, and the floor is in darkness. If you go into the dark side of the moon, an, a, another distance, and like. Uh, if you go from Aliensis to, to Werner and then go again to the right, that's where the lunar X would appear. But it's not. It's in shadow now. Uh, so that's where it would appear, but it's too soon. It's too early in the, in the night. So uh, maybe, maybe in an hour or so, we'll go back and look and see what's going on there. Um, because that's where it's going to appear. And so that's nice. We've caught it just before it starts. And what will happen is... Uh, at some point, you'll see a little pinprick of light appear in that darkness, and that'll be the highest part of the terrain in that area, catching catching the sunlight, much as you would have on Earth if if a tall mountain, if it was early in the morning and it wasn't the sun hadn't risen, but there was a tall mountain near you, and the the top of the mountain would catch the light of the of the moon. That's exactly what you'd see. And this is what we'll, we're going to be seeing here with the lunar X. So the highest part of the topography will catch the sun's rays because there the sun is rising on the moon. To the right, that's where the sun has already risen. To the left, it's still rising. Very nice. Um, so Dave? Yes, who's caught? The question is, it's Judy. Uh, there was a question through the chat. says, what oh. quadrant are we looking at? What quadrant are we looking at? We're looking in the south of the moon, uh, and we're looking on the eastern half of the moon. Um, I don't know if, the, if that helps. So it's the southeast quadrant. Directions on the moon are not the same as the directions in the sky. It's like on any planet. So... I was a little bit confused here because the uh, camera flips things around, but the, the sun, the, the terminator, the sunrise terminator, the terminator always moves from east to west. So here the moon's at a bit of an angle, but the, the, the terminator, the, sh the, the line between light and dark is moving down and to the right. And so that's, that's towards the west. And up and to the left is to the east on the moon. So we're looking at the southeast terminator. Does that answer the question, hopefully? Uh, I, will, I will assume so. Yes? Uh, David, one thing you might want to watch for, when you say right and left, uh, yes. I expect you're looking at a map as opposed to the image. I'm uh, looking at the image. I'm talking, when I say that, I'm looking at the image. Okay, good. That's what I wanted to know. So I no, moved it in the right direction. That's all. Yeah. Okay. No. That, no. The, I uh, and and my map is now reversed, so that the, all everything is copacetic. Um, Perfect. So one of the biggest problems with observing the moon is getting this right. I mean, and um, I think there's there's people watching who have had this um, experience where um, 
you know, you, when you go to the tie piece of your telescope, you have to make sure you have the right kind of map because th th there's a sort of the standard map, which is would be the moon as you as you uh, would see it in binoculars. And and then if you use the reflector telescope, a typical Newtonian reflector, all you would do is just rotate that map upside down 180 degrees and that's what it would look like. But if you have a star diagonal, there's no way you can rotate that map and make it look like what you see. You need to get the the mirror reversed map uh, of the moon in order to make sense of what you see. So um, you always have to make sure that you've got the right map for the telescope that you have. And if you know anything about the optics of your telescope, if if the number of reflections in your optical train are even, which means zero, two, or more, I suppose. So if it's a, if you're just looking at straight on with the binoculars or there's two reflections like in a Newtonian reflector or a binocular, it would just look the standard, it, you would just use the standard map. But if you, if you use a reflect, refractor with a diagonal or a schmidt cassegrain with a diagonal, you have an odd number of reflections. With a refractor, with a star diagonal, there's a reflection, one reflection. With a schmidt cassegrain there's two reflections and then an additional reflection if you use a star diagonal. So that's three, three reflections. So if it's an odd number of reflections, you need to use the mirror reversed map. And uh, you can get uh, both maps, um, well, you used to be able to get them on Amazon, but Sky and Telescope puts out a two maps. They have the, the, the regular map and the mirror reverse map. It's worth buying both. Uh, they're not that expensive. Can you hear me, Dave? This is yes. Anton Jopko. Hi, Jop. Hi, Anton. Yes, <clears throat> I think the point is that the we're, what quadrant we're looking at is that we're just before first quarter. Yes. So, so the bottom part of the bottom left part of the image on the screen is actually the top of the moon when you're outside looking at it with the naked eye. Um, so, not exactly, be, because um, I'm not sure what uh, Blair has. Blair, are you using your refractor? I am using my refractor and there is a star diagonal in it. So, so the refractor would invert the image, but the star diagonal flips it up. So apart from the fact that it's at an angle, no, north is up and south is down, but east and west are reversed. So does that make any sense, Anton? No, it, it doesn't because <clears throat> right now, if you go outside, of yes. course it's cloudy here in Ontario, but anyway, because it's almost first quarter, yes. the bright side of the moon is on your right. Yeah, uh, no, the, yes, in, in direct view, correct, yes, on your right. But here it's and on the so it's mirror reverse. On the screen, the bright side is towards the top. The left. Well, it's 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 oh, a bit left. of an angle. Yeah, it's it's up to the upper upper left. But yes, yeah. basically to the left. So if if you could rotate that moon image by to the right clockwise, say by about a hundred degrees, it would look more like it does in the sky without any telescope. No, 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 Anton, that's not true because this is a mirror reversed image. It would never use no amount of rotation <clears throat> would make that image look like what the moon looks like oh. in the sky. So let's say for this, let's say it's basically up, up and down. So north is still up, south is still down, but east and west are reversed. It's a mirror reversed image. Okay, I'm sorry. Then I guess no, no, I don't, don't be sorry. It, it is a very confusing part about observing the moon. And uh, it, it takes a little bit of time to get used to it. Um, uh, some people go to the extent of getting a special prism, which uh, reflects the, the, the image up, but doesn't reverse it, an Amici prism. I have such a thing. And it, I use it for public star parties because then when people look in the telescope, it looks like the moon in the sky, but it's just a magnified version of it. It's not flipped around. And so it doesn't confuse them so much. But there we have, um, is that still the main telescope or is that the guide scope there? Uh, that's still the main telescope. What you're seeing is a more magnified view of those two craters. Uh, you see it to the, uh, 
okay of the image there so i see yeah uh, at least you would if i stopped moving my cursor one sec so here's the fully magnified view yeah uh you notice the scale here is about 64 percent this is 100 yeah. okay so let's why don't we move on and look at something else um tell me where to go uh, politely and i'll go there well go to <laughs> <laughs> just why don't you just why don't we just take a little trip along the terminator to the upper right to see where we right. get yeah okay. just let's see where we get so let's see we want to go Oops, wrong way by the way this part of the moon is called the southern highlands uh, there aren't any lunar seas here they're they're, they're um they're the or mare it, this is a part of the moon which is um, it's the highlands and it's just cratered. There's crater upon crater upon crater. Okay, so we, I've, I've moved yeah. up the amount. Here's why don't, why don't we center that? Why don't we center that big? That one? I uh, know the one above that with the secondary crater inside it. Let's center that and have a look at that. Coming up. So the, one of the things that you see here is um, because of the lighting, uh, when you look at things along the Terminator, you have to imagine that if you were standing on the moon there, the sun would be very low in the sky and it's casting long shadows. So in this image, the sun is to the upper left and it's casting long shadows. So you can see that some of the craters, the, the crater floors are actually completely engulfed in shadow because the crater is deep and the walls are very high. The one we're looking at here has a sort of medium height uh, of, of wall. So you can see a bit of the uh, most of this crater floor and you can see on the left hand side there's a bit of shadow there which is the shadow of the crater as the so you have to imagine the, the sun's coming up over the crater wall and shining it at a fairly shallow angle. Uh, so that crater there um, is Hipparchus. That big crater is Hipparchus, and that's one of the that's one of the craters in Explore the Moon, and the the one that's to the lower left that's mostly in shadow is uh, called Alba Tegnius, which is again another of the targets in uh, Explore the Moon. So when you see craters along the Terminator like this. The, the shadow, the relief of the shadow really, it really brings out the topography of the, of, the, of the terrain. If you move away from the Terminator towards a part of the moon that's overhead, the, the shadows are almost absent and you can't really pick out the features quite so well. Um, I'm, I'm just doing that as we speak, bear with me. Yeah, if you go over there, like here's, oh, stop there, stop there. That's that's great. I mean, up a bit so we can get all three of them. Um, move, move, move. Sorry, <laughs> go down a bit. <laughs> there, there. There's a very nice look. There's okay. So those craters uh, a couple of days ago, or maybe even just yesterday, would have shown a lot more relief. So here's here's where the sun is much higher on the moon. Because you have to remember, the moon isn't a disc; it's a sphere. So as you go away from the center. Curve it, the surface of the moon is curving away from you. So we're looking at it at an angle. That's why the craters aren't round. They look like ellipses. You can actually figure out how far away you are by the fact that they, they're, they're narrower than they are long. Uh, so there's a nice trio of craters. They're called uh, uh, from the top to the bottom, uh, Theophilus, uh, Cyrillus, and Katerina. And that's a nice little those were one of those that group there is one of the first few features I saw on the moon when I started observing when I was 10 years old in my little telescope. It's a very prominent uh, feature. And um, here's a very good description or a very good example of seeing. Uh, if you look yeah. at the rebound mountain in the middle of this crater, look at this edge and you will see it get really sharp from time to time and then really blurry. And uh, you, you can actually make out that there's some additional detail. If I can zoom in here, uh, bear with me. So you, you can see that it, it blurs and then you can see it, it will sharpen up and you can actually see shadow on that mountain and it comes and goes with the scene. So I don't, 
I don't think Kathy's Kathy LeBlanc is with us now. If she is, just could you just speak up and say hi? No, I think she's going to come a little later. We're going to have to come back to this spot, uh, Blair, because the, the, <clears throat> of that three, the crater at the bottom is Katerina, and I've told Kathy already that that's her crater. So we have sure. to show it to her tonight. But one of the things you'll see, even though the seeing is poor, notice how ill-defined the walls of the crater are compared to other craters around. So that means the crater is very old. The crater was formed very uh, soon after the moon was formed itself. And over the year, over the billions of years that the moon's been around, it has, uh, the walls of the crater have been impacted by smaller uh, meteors and meteorites and things. And they've, they've sort of crumbled and softened. So they're not very well defined. They're, they're degraded. And that's, that's an example of an old crater with very uh, soft walls. Uh, we'll probably be able to show you something that uh, uh, looks different. You can actually see here, David, that there's another whole crater. Yes. Right here. Uh, and, and that, if the Terminator were just over here, so that this was in a little bit of shadow, that would stand out in quite nice relief. Yeah. Well, that's that's been a nice uh, demonstration of the effect of illumination on craters. So one of the things about observing the moon that you will find is that even though it goes through this cycle of 29 and a half days, when you actually look at the moon, it always looks different every time because of the lighting. So it never really looks the same way twice. So th that's why people, I think, are drawn back to it. They, they see features uh, that they haven't seen before um, or they show up in a different way. And, um, but I think, I hope everyone will agree that the craters and features near the Terminator are very uh, much more defined by the shadows. Anybody who is a student of art, mm -hmm. they, they know about something called bar relief. Um, and uh, you can fake that. If you're, if you're good at art, you can fake that. So if we actually, okay, here's another one. <laughs> this is a favorite of mine. In between those two craters, uh, um, Hipparchus and Alba Gitanius, Alba, Alba, Alba Tegnius, there's a little crater, this little round crater, right? That one there. Uh, maybe we can zoom in on that a little. Or oh, we already are zoomed in on it. Okay, so that there is the crater Halley, H-A-L-L-E-Y. And it's named after Edmund Halley, the famous uh, scientist, astronomer, the, the, the same fellow who worked out that the comet, there was a comet that came back every 76 years, and it was the same comet every time. He worked out the orbit of all these comets and realized that it was the same comet. And because he worked that out, they call it Halley's Comet. Um, That's I have a that crater there, Halley, Edmund Halley. All of the craters on the moon are named after dead people. You, you, if you have a crater on the moon named after you, that means you're dead. <laughs> um, that's not true. Okay, give me a counterexample. I think there's still one Apollo 11 astronaut alive, isn't there? Um, okay, that's an exception. <laughs> Was it Aldrin? Is Aldrin still alive? Aldrin is still alive. Man, you're not supposed to be a lunatic. I'm sorry. How did you know that? That's <laughs> the exception proves the rule, right? Anyway, the, the general it, rule it, is it has to be named after a dead person. But I guess, you know, because he walked on the moon, we gave him a let. Okay, he can have an. <laughs> All right. And those hey, craters are on the backside of the moon, so see, that's why they get away with. I don't think so. No, those are those moon, those craters are in uh, the Sea of Tranquility. Yeah. There's a whole there's a whole section there uh, called the Apollo section, and the Beerman and all the others are there. Okay. Yeah. No, the Apollo Eleven astronauts, though the craters that are named after them are just right at the landing site. There's three right in a row below where they landed. I don't know if we're going to be able to see those. They're they're pretty tiny. 
they are. Uh, the seeing probably is not good enough. They're yeah. They're in the. They're probably this size or smaller. Yeah. Well, the other rule is, which isn't really a rule, but it just stands to reason, is all the big craters already have names. So, <laughs> if you get your, if you get a crater named after you, uh, now it's probably a very tiny one. <laughs> anyway. Dave, you don't have to worry about Blair being a, a lunatic. He's actually an apologist. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Anyway, I wanted I wanted to say something more about the crater Haley. H Halley is um, I have a friend who's named Haley. She's her name is spelled the same as Halley, but uh, her um, her parents called her Haley. It's the same spelling H A L L E Y. She's uh, a friend of mine and we've done some projects together uh she's done some videography for me anyway so um that mo that crater is kind of special because it reminds me of my friend Haley, and um i sent her a picture of that today saying hey we're going to be looking at this crater tonight so just want you to know that so um, excuse me just a minute, folks. I'm going to go out and uh, tweak focus one more time here and uh, switch the camera over to manual mode instead of bulb mode so we can get the occasional snapshot here. And Dave? Yes. If you have, when you're talking about these cr craters, someone has suggested, would you have a rough idea of the size of some of the craters you're talking about? Uh, yeah, okay. I'll. What I'll do is... Um, because I have the moon atlas over here, I'll um, I'll just uh, I mean I don't have these things committed to memory. Um, actually, you know what? I'm gonna get out my atlas of the moon because it has a oh dear. Um, okay, so we were just talking about the crater Halley or Haley. It is. 36 kilometers in diameter with walls about two and a half kilometers high, according to Pat. <laughs> Pat, Pat Kelly? Yep, he answered that one. Did he, where did he find that? I'm looking in the moon, Atlas of the Moon, 21st century. Anyway, that's the right answer. Uh, and the, the, the crater that it's next to, Hipparchus, which I chose because it starts with the same letter, uh, is... Um, uh, Hipparchus is 144 um, kilometers. I guess that's kilometers, kilometers wide. Dave, uh, Patrick's probably cheating as I am. I, I'm using moon globe on myself. Yeah. So well, it's a piece of software for those. You know, I don't think it's cheating, Tony. Uh, um, I don't. I don't reserve any. I don't reserve much space in my brain for things that you can look up. <laughs> my brain needs to be engaged in other things than memorizing numbers. So things like that, I just don't remember. I have to look them up. The only one I remember actually is uh, this one. Um, Tomorrow night, we'll be able to see a, a feature called the straight wall. And uh, Roy Bishop told me that the straight wall, and I can't remember how many kilometers it is, but he said the straight wall is equivalent, the length of the straight wall is equivalent to the length of North Mountain uh, in the Annapolis Valley, whatever that is. So just file that one. I can remember that. I just don't know the number. So it's so. It's it's hard to talk. Okay, here we are back. I have no idea what we're looking at. We're gonna have to zoom out when when Blair. Apparently, we're at four hundred and seventy four percent. Name that crater. Um. Well, we have yes. Hello. Time for a quick question. Yes. As the moon transits across the sky through the evening, yes. does it rotate in the sky? Like, I was looking out on the last full moon, and yes. it looked like Tycho was almost on a 45-degree angle, whereas I always think of Tycho as pretty much in the south. 
Well, you, you're right. You know, what you, what you said at the beginning is exactly right. I mean, from the point of view of looking f in terms of the horizon coordinates, you know, the, um, you know, alt, you know, al azimuth and altitude, uh, the moon, the moon pretty much, the axis of the moon is pretty much north south along the celestial meridian, wherever it is. But if you think about it, as it rises in the east, that's tilted over to the right, to the left, sorry. And as it rises and goes past the meridian, when it's due south, then then north-south is north-south. I mean, uh, up and down is north-south. And then as it goes towards setting, it'll continue to rotate clockwise and it'll be tilted uh, to, the l to the right as it sets. So you're okay. absolutely right. It does rotate. I was just curious. Yeah, no, that's absolutely correct. And the last full moon, I intended to stay up late and try and look at it at like for three in the morning, but it clouded over, so I, I didn't get the chance to see it. I often see artistic pictures showing, you know, the moon rising on the horizon, and there's this picture of the moon, and and um, and then there's this beautiful, usually a seascape or something. And more often than not, I look at them and I go, "That's fake." And my wife says, how do you know it's fake? It could be real. I said, well, no, because the moon's straight up and down. And when the moon rises, it's always tilted over. It's not straight up and down, um, especially in the, in the tropics where most of these things are set. Um, uh, in the tropics, if you watch the moon rise, it would be over 90 degrees. It would be, it would be over on its side. So it definitely rotates in altazimuth as you... Um, is it pans across the sky and everything does not not just the moon everything it's just a geometry thing and that's why and maybe um, Blair might want to say something about this that's why you can't really use uh, or it's difficult to use an altazimuth mount to do astrophotography because of this rotation effect exactly uh, if you um, if you look at a, a German equatorial mount which is what I have out there uh, Basically, as the mount moves across the sky, the camera rotates at a rate that uh, allows that rotation to disappear. Uh, it basically rotates in the same direction as it moves, so it sort of keeps things nice and stable. I have a picture of that somewhere, but I won't bring it up right now. Okay. Where to? Blair, well, I'm telling you, I wish you could see my where my cursor is. Um, so uh, where are we? Where are you pointing? Where are you focused? Down there. If you go straight up from there, uh, straight, up. straight up, and there's, there's a crater, a fairly well-defined crater near the edge of the highlands just before you get to the Sea of Serenity, or sorry, the Sea of Tranquility. Uh, up, 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 almost there. Where's your cursor? Yeah. Okay. Stop. Go. Whoop. Gone too far. <laughs> where Where are you? Uh, I don't see your cursor, but my my cursor's over on the uh, buttons to move the telescope. Oh right. Uh, it's uh, yeah. I'm on, yeah. I'm on this nice dark crater here now. A little bit oh, down, yeah. and uh, no, that's too small. There's there's a bigger one to the lower left. Okay, lower left. That was down, not up. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just saying. Oop, wrong way there, sorry. Here, go down. It, it's coming. We're getting there, I think. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I'm having trouble figuring out where we are. Just stop for a second. Here's, here's the three craters that you were talking about, so you can use those to figure out where you are. Uh, okay, so I'm, I can't see, oh, there, no, no, I, we need to go way over to the, okay, I know what the problem was. I was looking at my cursor. <laughs> okay, so what we need to do is go up and to the right. Up, up this way and over this way? Up, the top, the, the, see the third, the first crater of the three at the top, the one with the central thing there. Yeah. And then over to the right of that. A ways over there. Go there. On my way.
There you go. Okay. Uh, so that there, I think, whoa. Yes. Yes. That there uh, in the middle is uh, called Delambra. And uh, people were asking for sizes. It's, it's a fairly deep crater. I can tell you what the, the diameter is. Uh, it is 51 kilometers. I, I don't know how deep it is. Um, now, if we go up from there, there's a, a pair of craters that are at the edge of the Sea of Tranquility. But these two? Those two. Go there. Wrong way. Sorry. That's okay. There are only four buttons. How can I get them wrong every time? Let's slow the telescope down a bit here. Good. I'll just take them up and center them here. And then I can zoom in. Okay, those there are Sabine and Ritter. Now, they're in the Sea of Tranquility. Now, the Sea of Tranquility is a huge basin. So that was formed when the moon was very, very young. And uh, so there was a big crater, and then it, the moon was still molten. So what happened was that the magma the basalt leaked up from inside the moon and flooded the crater. And that's what caused the Mari, the, the sea. And that's why it's so dark. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so if you just move up, if you follow those craters from right to left and go up a ways, around there, around there. Around there? Yeah, around there. That's close enough. Go there. Okay, one sec. Ah, I have to, uh, there we are. Okay, so now I can move it over. Okay. Uh, Wrong way, I know, it's coming. Okay. There we go. All right. Now, um, as, as, as best as I can tell, where that cursor is, uh, maybe a wee bit to the right, w right there, where your cursor is just at the moment. Mm -hmm. That there is pretty much where the Apollo 11 landing site is, okay? In that general area, yeah. And there are three craters, Armstrong, Collins, and Aldrin. I cannot see them. They're just too small. Uh, we would need a, a better seeing and maybe better resolution yeah you definitely need better seeing and higher power uh yeah. i thought i saw them come and go a little while ago for instance you can see this there's a little crater right here that comes and goes with seeing yeah uh and uh it, it's smaller than that one so uh it's it's down a little lower in this image as well so so Blair, would we get any, would there be any benefit in taking a photograph at this point or would it just get completely blurred? Uh, let's find out. Let's find out. It would have to be pretty quick. Uh, we'll have to take a couple here just to get some idea of what exposure we need. So uh, bear with me a sec. Okay, well, a thousandth of a second is uh, too short. Little. Let's go turn the ISO up a bit and maybe drop this down to 500 and let's see what that looks like. Uh, a little bit better. Okay, bear with me. So for the people watching, what we were doing before was a, a called live view, which is where, in effect, the cameras 
acting like a video camera and taking very, very quick exposures and updating them rapidly. And so what Blair is trying to do now is take a proper photograph where you, you expose it for a specific period of time, uh, probably longer than a frame of the video, maybe? I don't know. Uh, no, a uh, video frame is a 30th of a second. Oh, we're okay. 500th right now. So I mean, we're going to try to freeze. We're going to try to freeze the, uh, the the seeing. So we that's effectively what I'm trying to do. Yeah. So let's see what this looks like. We're getting uh, there. It's a little better. Can we can we move back to the? Um, we need to go up. Yeah, yeah, up there. So there's there. those craters. Yeah, we can we zoom in a little or. Yeah, yeah, that's it's it's not really sharpening up much, is it? No, no. What I would have to do now is take about uh, twenty or thirty of these exposures and add them all together to get rid of this noise. Yes. And do some processing. What it did do is that little tiny crater that I pointed out before that I said I was you know that was coming and going. You can actually see it right there. Okay. Just at the all top. Right. It's right, it's right on the edge of this crater. So it is a little sharper, but for purposes of what we're doing tonight, the video is probably the best route to go, uh, just because we can walk around in real time, so to speak. And uh, Dave, what I'm gonna yes. do is the camera is up at 29 degrees and the battery is going down. Uh, uh -huh. so let's just um, explore this photo for a few minutes while the camera cools it'll also give the uh, battery a little time to recover and then we'll uh, do okay it. well what else can we see on the photo can we zoom out can you zoom out whoa you can zoom out a lot <laughs> okay so the big blob in the middle is mare uh, tranquillitatis and then the sea of tranquility is that one so we're looking at the mare now if you went out uh, and looked at this, the the moon directly with your eyes, you could probably pick that out or with binoculars for sure. Um, so for those that are at home, if you want to go out and just look at the moon yourself, um, this, you know, this is what it's going to look like, except left, right, reversed, of course. Um, the one to the right of the Sea of Tranquility is the Sea of Serenity, Mare Serenitatis. You can see that these things most of these things are roughly circular in shape. So that shows that they at one time were like huge craters on the moon uh, caused by very large impacts when the, the solar system was young and there were lots of big things floating around. Uh, lucky for us, there aren't so many such big things floating around. <laughs> Once in a while, something comes by and goes kabang. Uh, above the Sea of Tranquility is Mare Crisium, the Sea of Crises. Now that's quite close to the edge of the moon and that's why it's squashed into an ellipse shape. If you actually were looking at the Sea of Crises, Mare Crisium, um, it would look round if you were looking above it, but we're looking at it, it's it's, it's curving away from us. It's, it's a sphere, the moon is a sphere. And it's, we're getting near the edge, so there's a lot of foreshortening there. There's also a few small craters. You can see one there. Yeah, you can. There as well. So one of the interesting craters there you can see. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, j just to the bottom of the Sea of Crises, you can see kind of a crater that's kind of shiny and has some rays uh, emanating from it. So. Yes, that one there. That is, what is the name of that crater? I used to know it off the top of my head, Proclus. And the reason that is so shiny is because it's a young crater. That is a fairly recent impact. And by recent, I mean, it may only be a billion years old. <laughs> okay. The moon is like 4 billion years old. And this one is, this crater may be, um, about a billion years old or even less. It'd be nice if maybe Pat Kelly could look that up. Maybe he could figure that out since he's so good at that kind of thing. And so what? why you see that white stuff is that is the um, material that's um, stirred up by the impact. 
and settles down and it has a, a bright a bright look to it and the rays that emanate from it are uh, so you can imagine something goes bang into the moon and it sprays all this junk all over the place and it falls down on top of the moon and it shows up as lighter material on top of the darker material and so that is a young feature of the moon uh, a better example of that of course is Tycho which is not a, a viewable tonight the crater Tycho but that's a a, a cool um, a cool um, uh, example in the northern hemisphere of the moon. Uh, this is not Tico, but here's another example just below where we were, Dave. Uh, oh, we yeah. Were up here, you can see there's another small crater here that's quite bright. Let me try to figure out what that one is. I'll zoom out so you can get a reference here one second. Yeah. Um, uh, it's right um, here. Yeah, you're, you're taxing my navigation abilities here. Uh, yeah, I see that. Where is it? Okay, so if you go down to there, it looks like it might be, it might be something called Sensorius, Sensorinus, Sensorinus, Sensorinus. I have this very interesting little app on my phone, as most of us do these days, and uh, this particular one uh, will display a map and it will name everything. Uh, and that crater, uh, let's see here, I gotta get on the right one. It doesn't, doesn't happen to be Ritter, does it? No, it's right next to Ritter. I mean, oh, well, we were, we were looking at Ritter and Sabine a little while back, but they're not, that's not up there. They're down further down. I think that is, uh, right. Sensorinus. Yeah, it is Sensorinus. Yeah. Who's speaking there? Who, who just Anton said that? Anton Jopko again. Anton, okay. So you know your way around a bit, eh? Well, I'm looking, I'm looking at a map of the moon on my other computer here. So. Oh, good, good. Yes. My, my cell phone says it's only three kilometers wide. So if you see something, that's amazing. Did someone, say that, did someone say that that's three kilometers across? Yeah, it's Tony, and I'm looking at uh, my cell phone. Sensorinus, yeah, Roman. It's four, four kilometers across on my screen here. Yeah. Well, there you go. Probably be about the same distance as from me to my favorite coffee supplier, Java Blend, over in Halifax. Now, for those that always ask, you know, can you see the lunar lander? Keep in mind that that is the image from my telescope at 123%. So we're digitally zoomed in and three kilometers across is pretty small. So you can imagine trying to see the lunar lander from here is, is not going to happen. I can't get too much information on Sensorinus. There may be something in the Isabel Williamson uh, Lunar Observing Program. On, on the other hand, I, I'm not saying I have a photographic memory, but it doesn't spring to mind. So it's possible it's in there, but it may not be. But um, there may be other resources that could explain why it's so bright. Um, anyway, is that, that uh, telescopes, is the camera still getting hot or still hot? Uh, it's not too bad. It's up at 29 degrees, so we can certainly go back to video here. Uh, one second and I'll pop it back. Well, we're really um, where? motoring along here. Uh, this is interesting. Where did the moon go? Uh, <laughs> one sec. It's there. It's just very dark. So I have to uh, go change a setting to uh, get it back. It's up at one five hundredth of a second. Oh, yeah. And uh, bear with me a sec. I think I might be able to change that here. When we do video, of course, we need a uh, much shorter exposure. Uh, don't know if I can adjust that here, if I actually have to go out to the camera and adjust it. No, I have to go to the camera. Bear with me just a second. I was wondering, uh, is, um, is Kathy online yet? Kathy, did you join? 
Yes, I did, Dave. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I, okay. I'm, I'm looking at Cl uh, Blair's screen, so I hear your voice. Oh, good. Yeah. How long have you been with us? You know, I've been listening for about 20 minutes or so. Really? Yeah, it's very interesting. Did you did you hear the part where I pointed out the crater? That's your crater, Katerina? You know, I thought that's how you were going to introduce me. That would have been very clever. Well, it, <laughs> you know, I, I could have done that well, if, I had, if I had known you were there. <laughs> for another <laughs> For another time, I, I didn't get, I wasn't here. I, you had, you must have spoken about it before I gone on, but I thought it, as you were showing the craters, I'm like, I wonder if he's going to introduce me by showing my crater. Well, I have mentioned it, in fact, twice <laughs> since we started. <laughs> so, okay, you know what? Blair's gone off to do something with his equipment. So this actually, it's great, Kathy, because I asked you to come at nine and you're there and Blair's taking a break. So this is a perfect time to introduce you to everybody. Um, I'm so happy that you're here tonight. I, it's just, it's really making my day that you're here. So, so Kathy LeBlanc is my friend and project partner in Mi'kmaq Moons, which is a project we started eons ago. Um, She's uh, a member of Acadia First Nations. She was she grew up on the Wildcat Reserve, and she um, went off to university, studied uh, indig Indigenous Studies and Criminology for, as a minor. And she spent um, a decade at Kejimkujik National Park and National Historic Site, which is where I met her in about 2009 or 2010, something like that. That's where I met Kathy at first. Um, she was one of the cultural obser um, uh, interpreters there. And it was when we were setting up the Dark Sky Preserve and through Kathy and uh, the other First Nation interpreters there, I learned that the reason that Kejim Kujik is a national historic site is because of the, it's the traditional home of the Mi'kmaq people. And there are many very uh, important cultural and sacred sites in Kejim Kujik, uh, which make it a national historic site. And uh, so Kathy's taught me a lot about all of that. And we, Kathy tells the story better, but I'll just give you the short form. Kathy and I got involved in 2013 or so. She wanted me to help her out with a program with uh, an indigenous group. Uh, talking about Hunter's Moon. And I said, like, there's no way I'm going to get up and do this by myself and present this in front of an Indigenous group. Do this with me. And that's how the Mi'kmaq Moons project got started. And uh, there's a lot there's a lot that could be said about that. And we, we're not going to take up a lot of time tonight about that. But if you're interested in the Mi'kmaq Moons project, you can go and find it on Facebook. And you can find us on YouTube because we have some video content. And the way we spell Mi'kmaq is M-I apostrophe K-M-A-W, moons. And I guarantee you, if you type that into your search engine, you will find us. So, so Kathy, um, mm -hmm. we're looking at the moon tonight. It's the first mm -hmm. quarter moon, almost the first quarter moon. And it is, um, as we know, it is the frog frog's croaking moon time. So I would like you to tell, we've got 34 people participating. I would like you to say a few words about the frog's croaking moon time and what the significance it is, it has for the Mi'kmaq people. You know, it's so interesting, Dave, because um, as soon as I brought, um, as soon as I, brought up the Zoom. I, I came into Zoom and this picture came up, what we're all seeing here. I immediately called my son and my husband in to look. And I said, look what they're doing. Look how, because we observe the moon um, a, a different way. We just, I, I observe it by looking at it. And I have, I have a deep appreciation um, for it and for the culture. Um, that my ancestors, I look at it as I'm looking up, my ancestors looked up, and I have, you know, this deep connection 
um, with my culture through the moon, but to see it this way um, is actually very, um, very interesting for me. And, and I, I may um, take part in um, another one of these, of these Zoom meetings that you're doing because um, it's, it's quite fascinating. But to talk about my ancestors, we would have used the moon phases and what's happening in nature uh, to tell a passage of time. So for me, um, the moon is this calendar. Um, it's the way in which my people um, knew, uh, along with cues in nature, um, what was coming. Um, we are hunters and gatherers. Um, so knowing um, when the game was coming, knowing when we had to fish, knowing when the berries were ripening, um, knowing when maple syrup was coming, when the birds were laying uh, eggs, all of that was very important um, for our survival. So right now, um, Dave, as you said, we are in the, um, the frog croaking moon time. And so for me, um, the other night, my son and I uh, and my husband were out looking um, at the satellites uh, that were passing. And, um, and I don't know if I said that correctly, we just saw satellites. And um, I said to Dave, they look like a flock of ducks that are that lit up the sky and we were looking and I was hearing the peepers and it was just this magical feeling for me of, you know, of being in that moment where my ancestors wouldn't have had telescopes. Um, they wouldn't have had binoculars. Um, they would have been viewing the moon in the same way that I view it and um, see the beauty um, through the eyes that way. Um, so being able to, you know, I was thinking about the different moon times and the next one that we're going into um, is the leaf budding moon time, but this one is quite special and we're getting a lot of, um, a lot of interest um, in this moon time through the Facebook page um, and through uh, a podcast that we, should, we just did. And I think it's because it's the one that we can hear and um, in the time we're in right now to be able to connect um, with the moon and hearing the peepers. Um, it's really uniting people um, in a very, you know, in a very special way. So when I look up at the moon and I'm, I'm seeing it here on the screen, um, I'm seeing it through, um, through a different lens. And it just how important um, it was for the survival um, of, of my ancestors and, you know, the stories that go with that and, and the stories that we're still sharing today. Um, and also the stories, you know, that I'm creating with my own um, kids and my niece um, around, you know, the timekeeping traditions and being connected to nature and how important that was and is. So I don't know if I, if I answered everything you wanted me to say, I probably talked more because I can do that, but. Well, well, you do go on, you do go on. <laughs> I, that's okay, you know, because when I ever, when I hear you talk, I just kind of, I just kind of sit back and listen and I kind of get lost in listening to you. And sometimes that happens when we present together and you, you turn over to me and say, Dave, aren't you going to say anything? And I'm going, what? <laughs> I was enjoying it, you know, so, and I, as always, I enjoy when you bring your own uh, personal perspective to this uh, as a, a woman and as a First Nations person, you know, it's, it's, it's great to see all these things through um, the eyes of another person. And so I appreciate you sharing that with everyone. Yeah, in a very non-scientific way, I think that, you know, if anybody uh, is listening to this and um, they have a wife or a husband or children who they're trying to, um, you know, share this passion that they have with astronomy, um, our, our project in connecting, you know, the moon with nature and telling passage of time um, is a very gentle and interesting way um, of, you know, sharing, 
in, you know, your, in the passions that you have. Um, I get very overwhelmed um, with the science part and, and that's why Dave's been so helpful um, to me through the years because I, I try not to get caught up in that. I try to just enjoy the beauty. So I would encourage anyone, if you do have a, a grandchild or anyone that, um, you know, you're, you're trying to share this with, that it's a good place to start. So I'm going to put you on the spot, Kathy, because I'm going to ask you a question. It's, it's kind of a quiz, snap quiz. Uh, so is there something special about the first quarter moon in the frog squawking time? Uh, uh -oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm angry at you now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, it's a good thing I'm not on the, on the screen because I would be you would see the anger. No, I don't know. I'm going to say no, but if you say it, maybe I will know. I don't well, know. Well, we talked about it. We were on the rate. We were on the phone the other day. Well, maybe last week, and we were talking, and we uh, our conversation with um, um, what was his name? Glenn Walker. Glenn Walker. Glenn something. Anyway, sorry. Glenn uh, Wheeler. Glenn Wheeler, right. Sorry. I'm sorry, Glenn. <laughs> uh, and he, we were talking to him and, and uh, we were talking about the, um, uh, we were talking about the feast that takes place, mm -hmm. that used to take place in Halifax or Chibucto yes. uh, every yeah. spring. And uh, the way I first learned about it was in a, in a book by a, um, a historian, a, 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 you know, a, a settler historian, um, Thomas, Thomas, Thomas Rodallo, who is known for writing history stuff. And in his history of Halifax, he mentioned that the, this spring feast took place uh, seven days after the new moon in May. And remember we were talking about that? I do see, I, again, I got caught up in what's on the screen. I was like, oh my God, it's something science related and I've got to figure it out. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. <laughs> What what I said at the time, I'll say it. I'll say it. I'm I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna get you off the hook because this is something I find really interesting. I read that and I said, well, what? Wait a minute. Se seven days after the new moon in May, and I'm thinking, well, before the Europeans came, the Mi'kmaq wouldn't have known what May was. May was unknown to them, uh, and so I sort of thought about it for a while. And also, I said, you know, nobody sees the f the new moon. So how could you count seven days? And then it occurred to me that what it was, was it was most likely the, the frogs croaking moon and they would, they would be counting the moons, you know, from, from the solstice. And it would be, I guess, is it the fifth one? Something like that, you know? And, and the seven day thing was, well, that's the first quarter. So, I mean, that's today or tomorrow, tomorrow night, probably more closely, it'll be the first quarter. And, and I thought, what a great way to say, I'll meet you. I'll meet you down in Ch Chibucto, in when when the moon is a half moon, uh, in mm -hmm. uh, in the frogs croaking moon. Mm -hmm. and so everybody would know. Okay, yeah, we know it. We'll we'll see you there. One day here, one day there. It doesn't make any difference, right? We'll mm -hmm. we'll we'll get together and we'll have our our feast. And so, right now, today or tomorrow, it would be the time that people would be gathering for this feast from all over Minwagi. They would come from all over. They take their canoes and come here to have this feast. And uh, so it's a, that's the significance, I guess. Anyway, we wrote that in our essay. I know it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time, but um, I, yeah, I will, um, I think that's that's what you wanted from me. I can talk forever, but um, I know this is this is very interesting um, for for your viewers. So I'll let you get back at it. Thank you so much um, for allowing me to take a minute. I'm very excited about this moon time, and uh, I've been on kind of a little bit of a high um, for a while, just hearing the peepers and. Um, knowing spring is coming and then having this this beautiful moon to look at so um thanks for thanks for having me thanks kathy just before you go though we should ask we should offer if anyone is listening there's 34 people participating we should ask if anyone has any any questions for you that you can't answer <laughs> yeah 
<laughs> that I can't answer. So, so anyway, is anyone, would anyone uh, have anything for Kathy or um, we'll give it a few moments there. I see a, something on chat, maybe, I don't know. Um, I think you've just overwhelmed everybody. They're, they're, just, <laughs> they're just, they're just taking that all in and sinking it. Kathy, you know, it's, I'm, you know, you're a friend of mine. I'm so happy that you came here tonight. Well, it's uh it's great it's, to have you here this is this is what i will offer dave if people want to take a moment i don't know how frequently you you do this but if people want to take a little bit if this is of interest to them and you know they they want to visit the facebook page and find out more about it it's it's really difficult to um give you know the full um story of of what we're working on so if people want to take a minute and look at that maybe look through youtube um if you were to ever want me to come back um i would do that if people have some questions oh we definitely want you back yeah maybe and we won't be in quarantine and i'll be able to to be on video <laughs> <laughs> i'm not uh, yeah okay let's let's just leave that aside <laughs> I should say before Kathy goes, I'm Kathy, of course, you're welcome to stay and part, you know, watch what we're doing for the rest of the 45 minutes or whatever we're going to do this, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to go away. You can enjoy what we're doing. Um, maybe I'm going to get, I'm going to get Blair to go back to your crater before you go. So we can, uh, we can zoom in on that. But um, I just want to tell people that Kathy and I are writing a book. Uh, well, I should say we've written a book. We've written a book. And we're just waiting for the publisher to figure out how to illustrate it because obviously we've um, we've just blown them away with our writing. They just don't know how to get the drawings, but uh, they're working on that. And we hope to have that book. Uh, I'd like to say it's going to be ready for Christmas, but I don't think it's going to be. But before long, there's going to be a book with Kathy and I. And um, don't worry, I'll tell you all about it when it comes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. Thanks, everyone. And and there's Blair. He's zooming in on your crater there. <gasps> Thanks, Blair. Katarina. She's, a, she's beautiful. Yeah, I was telling everybody before you came that it that the crater has been uh, had seen better days and it had become a bit decrepit over the years. But that's no reflection on you. That just happens yeah. to be what, the crater. <laughs> it's, it's still beautiful to me. All of it. It is. It is. Every time I see that crater, I think of you. <laughs> Katerina. So <laughs> thanks again. Thanks, everyone. By the way, that's 860 kilometers across and three kilometers deep. Yeah, well. <laughs> Where should we go now? Does anyone in the viewing audience have anything they want to look at? Should we go back and look at, see what's going on with the Werner X? Is that something we want to do? Go for it. It's Tim here, by the way. I joined us a bit. Right? Oh, hi, Tim. How, how's it going down in Southwest Nova? Clear and moony. I don't see anything happening down at the Lunar X. It's still it's still got a ways to go before we can see anything. I don't see anything down there. Do you? Uh, last thing I heard, someone looked it up earlier today, and I think it's not supposed to show up until 1030 or 1040. So what I don't know, is that mid-X or just the beginning? Yeah, maybe that's more the beginning, because if it was going to be the peak X, it would have been showing a bit by now. I still don't see anything. Uh, question for Judy. Um, there, she, she heard me. Uh, question for Judy. Uh, if we were to run over our time to try and see the Lunar X, is that an issue or do we have to set it all back up again? She's saying it's okay. There we go, Dave. So we might be able to see it. Okay. So the hardcore um, followers might want to stick around. It's going to be a while though. So it, it, you know, we can't snap our fingers and make it appear. So I, I, we'll, We'll check in uh, closer to 10 o'clock and see what's going on there. Um, Where to? Tro Troy is saying he's got nowhere to go. 
<laughs> yeah, I do have to work in the morning, but uh, I'm okay till about 11 or so. And, and I'm seeing Gilles, Gilles Arsenault. I'm not a, Gilles, where the hell are you? Are you in Ontario? Um, anyway, Jill Arsenault, who used to be a member of the Halifax Centre, quite an active member, she, he says, thank you. Uh, when I heard it was the frog croaking moon, I understood the reason as I heard them start up again last week. So uh, that's interesting. Oh, so Jill says he's back in Halifax. I didn't know that. Well, hope to see you soon at a meeting or something, you know, when all this is behind us. So where shall we go next we need to go north let's go north that's this way along the uh, north along yeah up up to upper up to the left of the um the terminator up sorry up to the right up uh, up to the right past those two big white ass craters that we saw i th i think by the way those craters might have been one of a couple of the craters that uh Galileo sketched when he was sketching the moon. Okay. So there's a couple of cool craters there. What are they? Now, Dave, if you would like, I can go turn the exposure up a little bit, which will give a little bit more detail in around the uh, Terminator. Yeah, that, could, that probably would be a little bit, if we could just uh, arch that up a little bit. Okay, give me just a minute, right back. Oh, you have to do that at the camera? Unfortunately, yes, but it only takes a second. Okay. All right, I'm trying to I'm trying to get my bearings here. Um, Dave, one of yes. the participants noted that he says, "I know the focus is on the moon, but would it be difficult to take a quick look at Venus?" Uh, well, that's no worries. That's a that's a Blair question. <laughs> um, um, it might be, but um, may maybe since he's not here, maybe I'll, maybe maybe towards the end uh, when we've done most of the stuff. It depends where Venus is. I don't know how high up Venus is at the moment. We have to make sure that it's um, visible from his location. We'll ask that question when he comes back. It's very bright. Um, so what are we looking at here? Uh, so that's Hipparchos. Okay. So up at the upper right of this of the big screen, uh, there's a um, another mare or sea. It's not a big one, uh, and we only see a part of it because the 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 um, terminator is bisecting it, and that is called mare vaporum, and that is one of the objects in Explore the Moon, by the way, mare vaporum, and. Uh, uh um uh just to the top uh just are you talking about up here dave uh no f the farther back yeah there it's, it's not as well defined in there it's it's very vaporum there's and there's a very well defined crater uh in the middle there which is um um manilius um and that's one another top. That's another object in the uh, explore the moon. Um, and oh yeah, to the to the left of Manilius, and a little bit up, a little bit up. Go up here. There, that there, that crater is called Julius Caesar. It's a very interesting crater because it doesn't have a full crater wall around it it's like it's like it's been flooded it's like the crater is on there that one yeah okay one That's, second i'll center it up and zoom in okay the uh seeing has improved somewhat it has uh, yes 
We're now up at 125 and uh, one second. So now we're up at 250 uh, yeah. and uh, it's still holding up reasonably well. So the seeing has improved. So there is um, more or less in the center is the ruined crater Julius Caesar. It's been, f you can see that the, at the bottom of the crater, you can see the, cr the walls are very well defined and there's, shadows and there's craters there's craters within the walls but at the upper left the, the craters kind of the, the walls kind of disappear it's because the it's an old crater and it was it was there before and when the basin when the basin flooded the bat the, the whole area subsided and the basalt flowed into that crater along with uh the whole um uh the whole mari uh, sea of tranquility and that's that's an example of what's called a flooded crater because it doesn't have a fully defined wall. These are the sort of details that, if you were to do the Explore the Moon program, you would just basically say, "Okay, I found Julius Caesar." You check it off, and this is what when I saw it. But if you did Isabel Williamson um, lunar observing program, it the Isabel Williamson program would would. Uh, ask you to sort of observe that and, and make a note of those kinds of details. That's the difference between the two. Explore the Moon is very, very simple, very sim similar to Explore the Universe. You you find the thing, you say a few words about it, you check it off on the list. But Explore, uh, sorry, Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program is a much more detailed and advanced program. And within each objective, it has sub-objectives. And I, I can't remember the one for Julius Caesar, but I'm I'm willing to bet a large amount of money that one of the things that you're supposed to observe with Julius Caesar is the fact, fact that it has a flooded, it's a flooded crater. <clears throat> and, and, it, and it has other features which show it's an old crater. It doesn't have very well-defined walls. It's very, they're very sort of rounded and smooth. So that's cool. In case anyone is interested uh, in what the difference is with good seeing, we're now seeing detail in the neighborhood of a kilometer across in these small craters right here. Uh, we dialed the magnification up approximately four times what it was before. So we're actually able to see fairly tiny craters. So let's head on back to the Terminator. I think we're on track for uh, seeing all the things that we had on our list. And again, if anyone has any uh, features they want to uh, look at, provided that they're illuminated, <laughs> we can we can go there. So that well-defined crater again is uh, Manilius. And if we go a little bit farther, so there you can see the entirety of the Sea of Serenity, Mare Serenitatis. I just stop there for a moment. There's some nice features there. Uh, so, so now we're seeing some mountains on the moon. We're, we're beginning to see some mountains. Um, if you can see the edges of that, of the, of the Sea of Serenity, you can see some quite tall mountains. Um, I'm trying to remember what they are. I'm going to have to use my map to. Dave, are they mountains in their own right or the crater wall of that huge crater? It's uh, a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but the way that they seem to surround the, the, the basin it may be just that they're part of the ancient crater wall, which creates the the um, uh, the mare, and and they've been beaten down a bit, so that it's not a regular looking wall. Um, so I'm just trying to find the names of these mountain ranges. Yeah. Okay. So, oh, uh, you need to zoom out a bit. <laughs> okay, can we zoom out? Okay, so there, a bit more, a bit more, a bit more. 
So there is, uh, yeah, that's great. So there is the sea of serenity and you, you, you can see when, when the, when the, um, when the Mari were formed, they flooded the, the basin and then there was a, a little bit of bombardment after that, but not a whole lot. So when you look at the floor of the sea of serenity, you can see the odd crater. Uh, which has punctuated the, the 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 Mari. So those are relatively new craters, and the reason you can see that one one is that one reason is that there's so few of them. And secondly, when you look at them, they're very well defined. Like they're very like round and sharp, and and not very um, frequent. So those are that there is um, Bessel. That's the crater named Bessel, and that's one of the um, objects in Explore the Moon. The one at the lower left corner is uh, Menelaus, a little bit bigger, also a fairly recent crater. And you can tell that it's a recent crater. It's very round, very sharp. The walls are very well defined. It's deep, you know, there's no, there's no sort of uh, erosion of, of those craters. Um, and when you zoom out a bit more, we can see the mountains again. That's where I was going. So at the Sea of Serenity, there's basically this big blob of, of basalt. Uh, to the lower right, you see there's an interruption of the mountains there. There's a bit of a, a flow through there. The, the mountains below that, that flow through are the Hymas Mountains. I think that's the right. Um, and the ones above are the Caucasus Mountains. And those are um, those are uh, um, objects in the explore the moon. I mean, um, thank you so much, Blair, for setting up this. When when you see when when you look at these with a telescope, they they really sh stand out in very sharp relief. Um, um, one of the reasons that I promote people uh, doing lunar observing, apart from the fact that it's just cool to do it, is that if you're, especially if you're getting, just getting started with a telescope and you, you don't have a lot of experience, the moon is a terrific object um, to observe for the following reasons. First of all, it's very easy to find in the sky. It, it, you know, it's not like looking for a galaxy or even a star cluster. I mean, there's the moon, you pretty much can see it. I tell people, if you can't find the moon, you really need to take another hobby. Because if you can't find the moon, you're, you're not gonna be an astronomer. Uh, <clears throat> so the other thing is that um, you can do this from your backyard or your front yard. You don't have to go to an, a dark sky site or an observatory. You can just have a small telescope, you can go out. Uh, even a small telescope will show so much on the moon compared to what you can see with your eye. Um, there's a lot of light, it's very bright, there's a lot of contrast, so there's a lot of detail you can easily see. You don't have to train your eye or work hard to see the features. Um, and just simply the process of training your telescope on the moon and learning how to point it and how to focus it and move it, all of these things that you have to learn when you're a beginner observer with a telescope. Uh, it's just so much easier when you've got the moon as a target. Once you've observed the moon and gotten comfortable, this is a perfect way to learn how to use your gear. Once you've gotten comfortable with the, observing the moon with your telescope, then when you go on and try to find things like galaxies, star clusters, planetary nebula, double stars, it will be so much easier because you've already figured out how to use your gear. So the moon is a perfect uh, starter object for somebody learning how to use their telescope. Okay, so there's some cool tele some cool craters there, just at the edge, the right edge, Blair. Maybe we can move that over. While he's doing that, Dave, Elizabeth Williamson or Isabel Williamson just notes uh, note the large eroded Jul Julius crater to the northeast. That's all that it stipulates. Is it not a, a main uh, a target of, no, of... It's in item 53, which is the main target is Rime Area Deus or whatever it's called. R Rima? Yeah, Rima. 
A R I A D A E U S. Uh, interesting. Okay. I would have thought that Julius Caesar would have been, huh? No, it just says note the large eroded crater Julius Caesar to the northeast. That's all. Well, we could all, I think we could all agree that it's eroded. <laughs> um, let me have a look on the map here. Oh, is it, um, oh, is it the hygienist, uh, the hygienist uh, riddles? Yeah. Um, they're just not showing up, are they, in this? That's a, that's a, that's not showing up in the, in the live stream. Uh, is it the hygienist rills you're talking about? Real, realist hygienist? What, what what I was talking about? Yeah, you said it was it was a an add-on to something else that we were supposed to be looking at. Yeah, Rima. I don't Rima. Know. Rima. Second now. Hygienist? Area mm. data Deus. Huh? Adius. A R I A D A U S. Oh yeah, okay. That's the main item. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure we're picking those up. Uh, those are the kind of challenging objects on the moon because they're like little channels, Rima. They're like um, little channels or canyons. And you have to have really good seeing and good um, resolution to see them. They're not showing up on the live view. But I'm I'm surprised that Julius Caesar isn't the main object. But it's yeah, been a long but, time. Yeah. Yeah, there are three required for that. One was the the Rima, uh, where it passes under other features that have subsided with it. Then uh -huh. note Julius Caesar, and then observe the parallel connection with Hyginus Rill to the west. So well, I'll tell you, I remember Hyginus Rill, which is like a canyon, and I could not find it many times. I looked, and it was one of the last things that I needed to find to get my Isabel Williamson certificate. And it was like, um, I had to wait till the perfect conditions arrived for me to see that. It was not an, it wasn't an easy thing. I don't think it was a challenge object, but it just was not easy. No, uh, I actually caught that when I was lucky, I guess. I guess you were. Um, yeah, so that's the luck of the draw. You've got to get the lighting right and you've got to get the seeing right. and it has to be clear. There's so many things that have to, have to work. So Blair, can we move over to the right and see those couple of craters that are there? Yeah, look at those. They are very easy to see on the moon. So those, those craters are, ooh, I better not make a mistake. So the bigger one of those two is Aristoteles or Aristotle. And the, the smaller one of those two is Eudoxus. I would say those are maybe not the newest craters, but they're fairly, you know, they're sort of medium, medium age craters. They've got, they've got pretty well defined walls, but if you focus in, if you zoom in, you'll see that they're terraced. Uh, so they have been, um, they've sort of fallen apart a little bit. Can you zoom in on that um, bigger crater there, Aristoteles? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> so below Aristoteles and a little bit to the right, there's, there's this crater, which is almost not there. That will go to the left, just a wee bit, wee bit, that one there, that one there, that there. Uh, I remember that crater. It's called uh, Egide or Egide. That there is the last object I needed to find in order to finish my Isabel Williamson Lunar Observing Program. And my oh my, uh, if you don't get the lighting right, like if when the sun gets a bit higher, poof, it just disappears. It is very shallow. It's hardly, you can just compare it to the other craters around it. It's hardly there at all. And um, yeah, if you wait, another day it'll be like where is that crater i can't see it that's what it's like and it was the last one and i had to get it just at the right time and i had to be clear and i remember i was watching tv with my wife and uh, and uh, i said uh, i know you want to watch this movie but come eight o'clock 
uh, I'm going to look outside. And if it's clear, I'm going to go observe this crater because it's the last thing I have to find. And we took a break in the middle of the movie so I could go do that. It took me 20 minutes to set up and look at it. I said, okay, I'm done. And then we finished the movie. <laughs> Great. Uh, now, uh, go down a bit. Blair, please. He's been very good, you know. Um, eh. There's a crater there. I can't see it. It's right on the Terminator, but it seems to be... Okay, Michael Taylor says a Getty is only 420 meters deep. Yeah, so that could explain a lot. I'm looking for Cassini, but I don't see it. It's, it's kind of lost in the shadows there. It's around there somewhere. Nope, it's just not showing up. So in Explore the Moon, when we say, oh, you know, you should be able to see this uh, at first quarter or the day before first quarter. <clears throat> Actually, first quarter technically is tomorrow. So you should be able to see it tomorrow. But yeah, it's they, always like give or take a day. There, there is something interesting here, though, to see. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. You'll, you'll notice as we come down here, there are a bunch of bright dots. Yes. And what you're seeing there is the peaks of additional mountains that are just sticking up into the sunlight and everything else below them is still covered in shadow. Right, right. That's what makes it so interesting to watch the lunar terminator. And if if you have the time to watch it, it'll change over time. This didn't take that long to change because when we first came here, those were not visible. Yep, yeah. Well, there's a, yeah, when, when there's the difference between nothing there and something there, that's a big change, <laughs> yeah. There's even a little bit of a, I can see it on my map. There's a little bit of a, do you see that little valley or whatever just to the north of that? Right there? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've got a name for that. It's called <coughs> Truvalot. It shows up on the, it shows up on the, um, uh, oh, wait a second. You know what that is? Is it still there, or did you move off it? Uh, no, one second. Uh, that, right that little bit. You know what that is? That is the beginning of the Alpine Valley. Mm -hmm. We're only seeing one end of it. The Alpine Valley is a big valley. So we're in that. Those points of light you're seeing are the Alps, the Alps yeah. on the Moon, and that valley goes from one side to the next. Uh, tomorrow morning we'll be able to see that uh, tomorrow evening we'll be able to see that uh, much more clearly but that is just the end of it that's about i would say about one third of the alpine valley uh so cool that's that's cool and and those peaks are part of the alps mountains so they're very, very tall and that's why they're showing up like that well that's neat You know, we've almost finished our tour of the, we've almost finished our tour of the things that I wanted to show people. I don't know if, I don't have the list handy. Is there anything we haven't seen that was on the list? Anyone checking that out? I see Judy looking like she's flipping through paper there, so. <laughs> That's amazing. We, we got through it all and it's like quarter to, almost quarter to 10. <clears throat> While we're waiting, I'm just going to uh, zoom back down to uh, where the X should be showing up here. Yeah. Uh, I have to move the telescope, unfortunately. Bear with me. Uh, let's see. We want to go, I think it's this way. Nope, wrong way. There's um, <clears throat> Hipparchus and Alba Get. Alba, I have trouble with that one. Alba Getnius and Haley, Haley, Haley. And there's the the trio, including Katerina. I don't know if is Kathy is still there. There's Katerina. We're going by. I think this is the beginning of the X. There, isn't it? That is. Let's zoom in on that. That is the beginning of the X. You're right. 
huh, there you go. We were looking at that, what, maybe whew, 45 minutes ago or something like there that? Was, there was nothing. There is the beginning of the X there. You can actually, see there, there's the, the crater wall right there, and we'll get another crater that comes in, and the walls. Yeah, you can almost see two. There's two arms of the X showing up there. Yeah, so it's one. happening. It's happening in real time. Well, yeah, you can see it. Well, actually, you know, you can when you zoom in like that, you can almost see four arms coming in. I guess me pointing at the screen doesn't help. Here we go. So here's one of them. Yeah. I don't know if I don't that is that another section of it there? Yes, it is. It's just it's just taking its time to show up, but uh, it always starts it starts with a line and then and, and it goes through a T phase and then into an X. So it it it's uh, true to form. It's it's uh, it's appearing. It takes a bit of time, but uh, what I'm doing here. All the, all the uh, places that you said you'd capture in all three groups. We've done them all. Yep. That's amazing because I didn't even have the list to go by. I was just going from memory. Uh, <clears throat> bear with me a minute. I'm just scrolling through. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to share a different screen here. Uh, uh -huh. the, the view will be non-mirror reversed, but it will oh. be the opposite of what we're seeing now. So think of it as it's been rotated around, but it'll so give you it, an idea the, of what the X looks like. Is it the guide scope or is uh, it? No, it's, it's a shot off my website that I took through my, oh. reflector, through my reflector. Uh, yeah. Bear with me a sec. I just have to share it. Um, here we go. I think. I think this will be it. There, can you see it there now? Oh yeah, that's a really great picture, yeah. That's, that's, that's almost good. exactly what it looked like when I discovered it for myself in 2004 at the Nova East Star Party. And when I say discovered it for myself, I mean it, it's been there all along and other people <clears throat> have seen it, but I, I found it for myself and made a big deal about it and and since since then because because of the magic of the internet and and all of that stuff social media it people started following it about then and uh it's become uh quite popular and the paper you produced is also cited in several locations as well yeah well if if there's one thing i know how to do is promote myself <laughs> it's <laughs> It's what you do when you're a scientist, eh? Anyway, I was just looking over the list of participants, and there's quite a few names that I recognize, a few that I don't. I just wanted to say hello. Uh, I see that Alan Dyer is following us, and that um, I'm so ha happy that he tuned in. Hi, Alan. Um, I I, uh, I consider Alan a, a pretty good friend. Now we. Last fall, we were on a, a ferry on the, off the coast of Norway, and we went up. Uh, we were on the ferry for a couple of weeks, and uh, we saw we spent many, many nights looking at the northern lights uh, and other sites up there. So, hi, Alan. Nice to see you. Um, and Alan tells me that um, that it wasn't even that good. <laughs> You know, that it's much, much better. But I was, we, my wife and I were just so happy to see the Northern Lights. And uh, I'll probably go back when the, when it's more um, active. But I, we, we weren't unhappy at all with the experience we had. We, it was the last big trip we went on and then um, like that. And uh, we, I, we don't know when we're going to be able to take trips like that again. But uh, there's good memories there, Alan. Dave, is there anything else we want to uh, take a look at while we wait for the uh, Werner X to uh, become a little more X-like here? Can, uh, I'm uh, I'm drawing a blank. I you know I I threw up a bunch of things that we should look at, and we've looked at them all. I, I mean, it's been really good. Um, I, I guess. Dave, Dave, what 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 are the names of the two craters to the east of that X? Okay, that's a good one. Uh, the one that's closest to the X is called Werner. And the other one's called Aliensis. And that's why when I wrote my 
uh, article on this back in around 2007, I think it was. Uh, I was trying to call it the Werner X. Other people call it the Purbeck cross and so on. I call it the Werner X is because when you see the X, the closest crater to it that you can find on the moon is Werner. It is in fact connected with Purbeck, but you can't actually see Purbeck at the time the X is visible. So anyway, I, I just, I tried to stick Werner X. It, it didn't stick, um, that's okay. Some people call it the Lunar X. Some people call it the Purbach Cross. A couple of friends of mine wanted to call it the Chapman X. That certainly didn't stick, but I appreciate their efforts. Um, so people like Alan who are farther west will be able to have a better view of that at a, a decent time of night. I think it's probably gonna, the moon's probably gonna get pretty low or even set before we can get a good view of the X from here. Although the this moon sets really late, it's like 2.30 or something. And it's because the moon is at a very high declination, like it's in, I think, Gemini. So it's where the ecliptic is very high. And because of that, the setting time of the moon is very late, well past midnight. Um, for, for a phase this early, you know, it's even before first quarter, but it doesn't, the moon doesn't set till like around 2.30 tomorrow morning. Dave, one well, of the things, sorry, one of the things I'm going to do, I'm going to go out and just try and focus a little better. I don't yeah. get any better, but I'm also going to turn off my dew heater to see if I can uh, steady things out just a little bit. Um, so I've not gone anywhere. I've just gone out to the telescope to uh, attempt to uh, clean okay. that up just a bit. Oh, somebody's asking about the Lunar V. Um, yes, we probably can see the Lunar V. I'm trying to remember where it shows up. We're going to have to wait till Blair gets back to move the telescope, but we'll we'll ask him to do that since he was asking to look at other things. So that was Alan asking the Lunar V. Does anybody know where it's where it's near? Hi, Dave. Alan here. I, I, oh, did hi, Alan. See it in the, I did see it in the wide shot when, when Blair had it zoomed out. It was okay. just showing up on the Terminator further north along the Terminator, just beginning as well. Can you give us a, a, a kind of a general idea of where it is, what features it's near? Or? Oh, I forget the crater. It's like a single crater that kind of forms it that's catching the sunlight. Um, yeah. But once once Blair gets back, he's focusing it now. Once he gets back, oh yeah, that's really sharp. Yeah, that's getting better. Yeah. Uh, so once he gets I, back I, uh, and zooms out, uh, can, you I think you can probably see it for yourself once he goes to the wider view. So Alan, I I don't associate you much with lunar observing. Is that is that something you've haven't well, spent a lot of time? Well, I. I I not that often, but boy, I had a, I had a, a wonderful evening last night. I think it's going to be a little too cloudy tonight, but a wonderful evening last night. I was actually taking some images of Venus, which I rarely take any pictures of planets, but right. the moon as well, because they were almost identically the same phase last night. Okay, yeah, and um, and uh, it was a wonderful view of the uh, of the moon. It's it is as you say, it's just it's just great. We take it for granted and we, we ignore it. Us veteran observers, oh, it's the moon. But no, it's just amazing. You really do feel like you're in a spaceship going over it. Yeah. It's a wonderful, wonderful tour. And it, it, but it is nice to have someone like yourself there saying, oh, that's that crater. And it, that's what's significant about that crater. <laughs> you know, so you well, a, little, well, a little more about what you're looking at. I sort of fell into it. Um, I didn't set out to become a lunatic, but. I have to say, I still have my observing logbook that I started when I was 10 years old, uh, when I got my first telescope. I still have that three ring binder. And the first thing that I looked at with my telescope and wrote down my impressions of was the moon. So, you know, it was the first thing I did. So after all this time, I've come around back around to it and um, did it in a much, uh, much more detail and uh and um i sort of fell into it and i, I kind of became the the halifax center moon guy um but it, it is i do find it fascinating 
Um, yeah, and as you say, even though the moon doesn't change much in billions of years, our view of it is different every night. And it every is. Month. That's correct. And, it's yeah. And once you get to know some of these features and, and do begin to be able to identify them, just like finding the stars and identifying the constellations and getting to know the sky, once you get to know some of these craters, you realize, oh, that looks different tonight. It, that's, that's a different lighting than I, I can recall. And look at that. I mean, even looking at the, your, your tours tonight, oh, what is that just lighting up? Well, who's just lighting up on, on the interior like we're seeing now yeah, with the yeah. earth? Even now, in the last 15 minutes, it's gotten more prominent. Yeah, I'm looking at the Lunar X now. It's a much more prominent. So for the other people tuned in, I just wanted to mention who Alan is, if, if they don't know already. I mean, Alan's a very well-known astrophotographer and uh, um, planetarium produce, show producer. Uh, he's done so much. Ed editor of Astronomy for a while, Astronomy Magazine. I think that's correct. And... I was with the magazine. I wasn't oh. the editor. I was one of the editors 25 yeah. more years ago now. But I keep but, in touch with that. But, yeah. you know, author of many books and um, an all-around nice guy. He, he came to Nova East a few years ago. And one of the things I appreciate about, appreciate about Alan, he, he didn't come in as a celebrity. He came in as an amateur astronomer. He gave a couple of talks, but he hung out with us. He observed with us, he talked, you know, he was there the whole weekend and that really impressed me, you know, and, and, and I know, I knew him more recently as an astrophotographer and I had my telescope there, my 12 inch telescope, Sky Watcher. And I had bought that telescope because Alan had reviewed it in Sky News. And because of his recommendation, I said, I'm going to buy this telescope. And so there he was, there was the telescope I bought and, and I lost power, like my battery got dead or something. And I was like, oh man, you know, we can't use the telescope because we have no power. And Alan goes, what do you mean? We could just point it and look at stuff. And he was just pushing the telescope around and picking things out of the sky. And, and I was like, the guy knows his stuff, you know, like, this is amazing. He, you know, he, he, electricity doesn't stop him. He, he's picking stuff out. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. This is looking beautiful tonight. So I had forgotten that before he became this uh, quite well-known astrophotographer that he, you know, he had paid his dues as an observer and he, he had uh, compiled the, uh, you know, the Messier list for the handbook and uh, I guess the finest NGC, Alan, did you do that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Back in, back in the in 1979 or 1980. And, and that's, uh, that really teaches you a lot to go through one of those lists. Um, yeah. Just like you're saying tonight with the moon going through the Explore the Moon, the Isabel Williamson list, whatever, just making that project, taking on that challenge and just going through it. And you will learn so much. And, and just like you're doing with the moon, where you can look at that and say, oh, that's that crater, such and such. And it's whatever, it's named after so and so. You get to know that. It becomes yeah, a familiar yeah. backyard to you. And uh, just like the constellations and stars are being able to pick out, you know, a deep sky object, same thing. Yeah. The moon is so intricate and so complicated and so um you know complex rather that you think oh <laughs> there's there's too many craters to figure it all out well no if you take your time and just as you're doing tonight pick out those few major craters just like a few major stars and constellations and those are your anchor points yeah. <laughs> there and uh and then and then oh there's this little one over here and it's named such and such and, and whatever uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe now if Blair's back, we can zoom out a little bit and perhaps, um, is, I can show you where that lunar V is. I'm sure I saw it earlier on. Did you catch that Blair? Uh, he wants to go, he wants to go north along the, uh, um, uh, uh, Terminator and pick out the lunar V. Okay. Let's see here. So no, I think there it is. I can see there it there. It there it is up, up the top right there. It's in the Mari Vaporum. We were back, we were over there before, but I guess it's a bit more defined now, is it? We're yeah, I, it looks like it. That's right, it. Yeah. Right, that's right, right there, right there. That's it. Yep. That's the, the lunar Oh, look at that. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I didn't see it like uh, certainly not with that kind of clarity before no uh, that's that's probably just come come into view in the last uh, half hour yeah anyway so, alan you know, uh, uh, again say, uh, nothing changes in the sky and there we've seen changes 
it, just since we started uh, uh, an yeah. hour or two ago. So, yeah. So again, uh, thanks so much for, for coming. Uh, we're honored by having you join us here. It's great I've to see great you. Fun. Great. Hey. Yeah, uh, who's there? It's Tony. I, I just happen to be a guy who's uh, been in a couple, a couple of weeks a month working on the floor of the moon with the telescope. Yeah. And then the other rest of the month, I'm working on this GD NGC finest list. Yes. So I'd like to thank Alan for creating that. And uh, I'm really enjoying both of them. And it, it occupies most of the night when they're, uh, they're clear. I can do one or the other. So uh, I, I rec highly recommend to anyone else who wants to get down to the basics of observing, take on these two programs. Uh, Tony, does that make you schizophrenic? What? <laughs> <laughs> a, a lunatic and a deep sky observer? Yeah. The problem there, I know. It just makes them stellar. Ooh. Ah, ah. Thank you, Judy. So things things like the lunar V and the lunar X, they're not they're not sort of recognized features in the cartography of the moon. Like you you don't find them on maps and stuff. And the reason is because they're a trick of the light. You know, if you look at them in the full light of day, they don't particularly look like much. They're just craters or whatever or mountains. It, they only appear at these sort of special times, these special times of the lunar cycle, and and so you, it's it. They're not a they're not a, a, a feature. They're sort of more of an apparition because it's a combination of topography and lighting, and um, uh, a lot of people, a lot of veteran lunar observers, kind of they don't think much of them. But I always think it makes life interesting, you know, to show things like that. People are really excited to see the X. And I, to be honest, I haven't really looked for the V. So I'm very happy that Alan has pointed it out that it shows up at the same time. Here, here's a little bit of a, uh, a camera trick with the software I'm using. Here is the Lunar X, here is the V. So we're actually watching them both as they evolve at the same time here. How did you do that, man? Did you? Uh, the uh, the zoom window doesn't move as I scroll around. In the ah. So the zoom window is showing the X and the V we've got right here. Well, that's kind of cool to have them both at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and the, the X is a, a lot more defined now. Yeah. Now, we have had a couple of people pop up in chats there. I didn't... Uh, I've been moving around and trying to keep things in view here. So if anyone has a question on chat, Dave, you might want to take a quick look at them. Um, wow. Um, yeah, okay. Let me have a look here. Uh, somebody asked about the asteroid. What impact would it have on the moon if it were to hit? Um, Preparation A shrinks them, by the way. <laughs> uh, I guess the, the asteroid question, I guess I'd have, I don't know much about how big it is. Um, so um, I'd have to defer on that. I'm, does anybody know how big that asteroid is? It's not terribly bright. Um, it's about one and a half kilometers in diameter. No, I, did a not... quick, I used a quick online calculator and said if it hit the moon more or less head on, you'd end up with a crater 30 kilometers across and about 800 meters deep. Uh, nothing to I sneeze at. It was made out of fairly dense rock. But it's it's going to miss us by what sixteen moon distances or something. It's it's not anywhere near us. Yeah. Oh, if you read the paper, it's, uh, it's a terrible hazard. <laughs> uh, and somebody Troy asked if there had been any new uh, craters formed by impacts in recorded history. Are they all older than the telescope? Uh, I can actually answer that. The answer is yes. And not only have they formed, people have video of them forming. Uh, some people view the moon and videotape it every night. And there has been several instances of them catching impacts on the moon, several of which have been shown to have left craters. Now we're talking very small craters, but uh, nonetheless, the answer is yes. Yeah, there's something called transient lunar phenomena. I guess that would ca classify as a transient lunar phenomena. It's pretty transient, yep. I think, 
one of the lunar eclipses a little while ago, I thought somebody might have observed something during the eclipse and probably only because they were looking at it because it was an eclipse because, you know, the, a lot more people would be looking at the moon. <coughs> We've got another question cropped up here. Uh, oh, it just says there was a strike recorded during the eclipse. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, John. Now you can start to see more and more of the Werner X uh, showing up here now in the zoom window over here. Um, we have one last wall of a crater rim to show up to, to complete yeah. the X. So Blair, um, we've, we've gotten to 10 o'clock, which is, we, we said we'd do this for a couple of hours, so we're there. So I guess officially the, the event that we've advertised is at its end. Um, uh, we could carry on as long as you would like to, uh, but I would, maybe we should just kind of, for those who might want to go, maybe just wrap this up and if, if are you happy to carry on for a little time? Just... I'm happy to carry on till probably about 11 and uh, okay. I'm going to hit the sack because I do have to be up tomorrow morning. <laughs> to work at home. Yes. Yeah. I have one of those nasty meetings to have early in the morning. Yeah. Well, I have to, I, I have to confess that today I actually did get out of my pajamas, but yesterday I did not. It was snowing and I just said, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying here and there's no reason to get out of my pajamas. The snowstorm I am blaming on my neighbor. Uh, we walked by his house the other day when we were uh, out for a stroll around the block. I was walking my dog. And uh, he was putting his summer tires on and draining the gas from his snowblower. So it's all his fault. Um, somebody on the chat list is concerned about your battery life. Are you concerned about that? Not at all. It's about half now. And uh, we've been shooting video now for two hours. It's probably got another hour to go before I would get too concerned. Okay. And I have a spare so I can swap. So, uh, so for those who can't stay up with us. Uh, if that's the case, you're not really astronomers. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I just want to say um, thanks so much for coming into this event. Uh, we, we tried this once before and it was a kind of a disaster owing to the clouds, but this from my, this is, has been perfect as far as I'm concerned. This has been an amazing <clears throat> evening of, of seeing the moon and talking about the moon. And I thank you so much for tuning in and 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 you know we've we've had a pretty good audience pretty consistent audience we're you know we were up to 34 i think and we're only down to 30 so people have really stuck with it and we really appreciate uh everybody's interest in what we're doing and uh um blair you know i'd be i'd be willing to do this again if you are yeah it's not particularly difficult for me to set this up uh it, yeah it, at least it isn't when my network works. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this almost didn't happen. Uh, I had a uh, major network problem, uh, probably what, Dave, seven o'clock? Yes. And, and, I, uh, and I, had the, I had the brilliant idea that, that uh, Blair should bring all of his gear over here and work out of my driveway. And he said, uh, no, we're not, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, right, we can't do that. Uh, anyway, so he, he fixed it. So, so, you know, thanks so much for everybody for tuning in. Uh, I, I, I can see a number of the names. I'm not sure where everybody came from. I am hoping that there's people across Canada, maybe some people from the States. I'm hoping that some people have joined us for a part time anyway, from the Mi'kmaq moons, uh, page because we promoted it there because Kathy was going to be on. I hope that some of the f people that came were from that place. Um, it, it's been a lot of fun and thank you for coming. I guess we're going to carry on uh, as, as long. I guess we have to ask Judy if she's willing to carry on. Judy, hello. Judy. Uh, yeah, sorry, my mic was muted. Um, yeah, no, I had coffee late this afternoon, so I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, so we will you know, we'll, we'll carry on in a very sort of casual way. We're not going to try to do too much. Uh, 
in terms of a guided tour. We've, the guided tour went very well and we did everything. Uh, Alan said thank you, goodbye, and Tim, you know, so people are saying goodbye. That's nice. Really good to see that. Um, so we can just carry on in a very kind of casual way and um, follow, follow these features as they evolve. So what I've been doing here, uh, uh, just to fill everyone, I've, I've been playing a little bit with the various screen stretch functions in the software that I'm using, which is Backyard EOS. And uh, now you get a really good view. The X is starting to complete here now. The, the last crater rim is starting to uh, come into sunlight. And so, you know, over the course of what, half an hour, it went from barely visible to almost a complete X now. Yeah. So, so on, on the chat, chat list, we're getting a lot of thanks from everybody. It's really nice to see people are thanking us for what we've done. Uh, honestly, it, to me, it's just a lot of fun. Like it's not any kind of work at all. It's great, great to do this. Um, what were you going to say, Judy? Uh, I've got a question for Blair. The uh, what is the current correspondence between the two images we're seeing in the center? Um, it's different. What what you what you're seeing is the image uh, on the right here. Is uh, one second till I zoom move. Okay, so what you're seeing, if I turn this on, is this area, and. All I've done is I've moved, this is the standard zoom uh, that you see on a Canon camera, um, even on a Nikon where you can zoom in and out in live view. Uh, so that's what you're seeing on the right is just the area in this rectangle. What I've done is I can also zoom the main window in and out and move it around, but the zoom point remains locked. So I can move up to the lunar V as it's been uh, called here and still keep the zoom window in on the lunar X. So here's a question, Blair. Uh, while you were out adjusting your scope, somebody wondered if we could uh, image Venus. Is that, is that possible? Is it, is it uh, high enough up to, to look at Venus or? Well, it's still visible. Uh, one second, we can take a quick look I don't know whether we'll be able to get it for two reasons. Uh, one, <clears throat> I haven't aligned the telescope that well, so the pointing accuracy might not be great, but let's find out. We'll just let the camera cool down a second here. And uh, I have to uh, select the piece of software that's behind here. There we go. And we will go to... So you can slew to that without having to go to the telescope? That is the plan. Okay. So why, why was, well, you need to go to the telescope to adjust the focus. camera, the focus. Yeah. And, and and anytime the, I have to adjust focus, I don't have a, a, an automatic focuser yet. But the exposure so, too, I think, right? Uh, yes, but that's a function of the Canon camera. Uh, huh. What happens is, bear with me a minute, I have to move a window here. Uh, oh, come on. There we go. Uh, what happens is there is a, uh, a weird thing that Canon did with its cameras. Um, I think they've stopped doing it, but effectively, if you have the camera set on manual, it will do exposures from 30 seconds down to, you know, a thousandth of a second. If you have the camera set on bulb, it will do exposures from one second up. Uh, right. the result, uh, if I want to, and, and live view uses that exposure to simulate what you would get looking uh, at an image taken with the camera. So I have to go actually change that value on the camera. It's kind of a dumb thing that they did, but what can I say? Yeah, I think I can almost understand that. Uh, let's see here. Now, Since I have a Canon camera, but it's like a different setting. It's a different physical setting on the camera, isn't it? It is, yes. It's it a is. difference yes. between bulb and, and uh, yeah. So here is Venus. Um, oh, yeah. Oops, sorry. Uh, one sec. If I lock that there. There is a crescent Venus, a very bright crescent Venus. I'd have to go change the exposure, but we could take an image and see how it turns out. One second. Um, Alan mentioned before that yesterday that 
Venus and the moon had um, the same crescent shape. And, and that makes sense to me because uh, v Venus and the moon yesterday were more lined up in the sky. Now there's two circumstances you could have that. You could have Venus on its orbit close to you or you could have Venus on its orbit farther away to you. But we know that it's actually past its long, nearest, uh, most um, longest elongation and getting closer to us. So it makes sense that the crescent shape of Venus and the moon would actually be similar if yeah. they were in the same direction in the sky. <clears throat> yep, uh, I'm going to try taking the, uh, bear with me, the ISO down a bit here, just to try and cut down some of the glare from the planet. Yeah. Uh, the planet is quite low, so you can see what's called uh, atmospheric dispersion here. You'll notice it's blue on this side yes. right over here. Uh, there we go, that's a little better. That's pretty good. <clears throat> so I was gonna say this, um, I'm gonna say this uh, uh, when we have our meeting on Saturday, and I'm doing the what's up. Uh, I'm going to say it now for those people listening. That between uh, Venus has been high in the sky for a very long time and through the winter, uh, but it's gone past its elongation. It's gone past its its high uh, mo most brightness point. And over the next month, May from the beginning to the end of May, it's going to in the evening. It's going to plunge from where it is now, almost plunge into the sun by the end of, of May. And it's going to move very, very quickly, and it'll be setting earlier and earlier. But as it approaches us in its orbit, it's going to get a thinner crescent, but the crescent's going to get bigger because it's going to be closer to us. So it's going to be very interesting in binoculars to look at the crescent of Venus. It'll change almost night to night. Of course, in early June, it's going to be in um, uh inferior conjunction with the sun, a very close inferior conjunction. In fact, eight years ago in June, we had a transit of Venus in 2012. And this would be a transit of Venus, except for the fact that things have shifted a little bit. So you only get these transits uh, for uh, a very long time, there's no transits, and then you get a couple eight years apart. So eight years ago, there was a transit of Venus. And this year, there's a, an, it's, it's just going to miss the sun by a tiny bit in early June. Yep. So given that Venus is going to be in the direction of the sun in early June, you can understand why by the end of May, it's going to be very hard to see in the sky, but worth looking at in binoculars. For those that are watching as I snap pictures here and sort of wonder why Venus looks so crappy, uh, it's a combination of three things. Uh, as you can see, it's really distorted there now. Uh, Venus is getting low in the sky and it's over a neighbor's roof. In particular, it's over said neighbor's chimney and his furnace is <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so you're, have, you're seeing very bad seeing effects. I often wonder about that, Blair, because like what the way my, my, the way my um, property is configured, uh, I can see south from my backyard, but it's over my neighbor's house. So when I was looking at Mars at opposition last time, I was not getting good images. I just could not get an image of Mars. And I was wondering if the fact that it was low in the sky over my neighbor's roof uh, had an effect. Absolutely. It does here uh, all the time when I'm working with the refractor. The only spot that that has never caused me any problem, and I have no explanation for it, is when we do public observing at Atlantic Photo Supply. Looking right over the building, we can still look at the moon and targets at 400 times in the refractor. and. I yeah. cannot explain why. Maybe the, the maybe the heat loss is not as concentrated, or I uh, I'm not sure. Art Cole had a suggestion that seems to make some sense that you're getting a laminar flow up off the uh, harbor, and maybe it's making for nice smooth air. I have really no idea. That's that's getting pretty technical. Yeah, gen generally speaking, when you look over a building, the heat from the building really yeah. just the image. That's what's but happening here. You're so getting, I'm going to have to take down my neighbor's house? Is that what you're saying? I'm going to have to... Much, yeah. Yeah. The, there's atmospheric diffraction here, or dispersion here, rather. And then yeah. the last thing is we're looking through tree branches. <laughs> oh, it's getting pretty low. It's only 14 degrees above the horizon. That's getting pretty low. Yeah. And I have a big tree in my front yard, and it's looking through the trees. So. <laughs> well, uh, but but 
And you swear your optics are perfect, right? My optics are fine, yes. <laughs> uh, when we go back and look at the moon, it won't look that way. Well, I think we've satisfied the um, curiosity of, I can't remember who asked, but uh, there's Venus. It is a crescent. Um, yeah. Is the Going moon back. still there? Where's the moon? Uh, it's coming back now. It's still so pretty high up though, eh? Yeah, if you look here, uh, here's the present position of the telescope. I'm assuming you can see that. Yep. And it's moving up toward the moon here now. So you can see there, um, the moon is uh, pretty close to Castor and Pollux. And if I'm not mistaken, that is where the ecliptic, the curve of the ecliptic has the highest declination. I believe that to be correct this time of year. That is uh, about six that, hours or something, six hours RA or something. Yeah, and I think that if I remember correctly, that is why the moon is so high in the sky at the moment. It's high in the sky, and because it's so far north, it will it will set very late, um, even though it's only not even first quarter. Um, so yeah. So when are we gonna when are we gonna lose the moon uh, in your local horizon? Is that is that oh, gonna be our limit? Not for a lot, not for a while yet. Uh, I mean, I'm looking up. The moon is a good what uh, 50, 60 degrees up there at the moment. From well, I'm probably off on that because I'm sitting down in a chair here, but it's up quite high. I feel I feel um, a little guilty that I haven't actually gone out and looked at the moon with my eyes tonight. I've been looking at my <laughs> screen so. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes and just go out. Uh, so talk amongst yourselves. I'm just uh, going to set the telescope or the camera rather back to the settings we had so that we can get a decent look at the moon again. Uh, we were down around, I think, a 60th of a second thereabouts. And if we go back now to video modes, see if it gets any brighter. And it does not. It's interesting, it didn't change. Bear with me a sec. Some questions regarding resources for observing the moon. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I forget who asked it now. Uh, let's see here. That was Troy Sweeney who asked it, actually. Um, and Mike Taylor suggested the um, Charles Wood Atlas. Hopefully, you can see that. That's what the title of the book looks like. Um, that's the one that uh, Michael re referred to. Um, and this is the one that I referred to, which is, like I said, if you want to give up your first child, you can own. And can we see you? Can, can we, I, I, all I can see is um, Blair's screen. Can we see you at all? Uh, I can, just a second. Because you were showing people things and I don't think, I think you're going to have to steal the screen away from Blair. Yes, yeah, one second, I'll just stop sharing, uh, Judy, okay. and then you can share. There you go. Okay, I want to cancel that. All right. So, um, second here. <clears throat> um, I don't want to share my screen so much as I, let's cancel No, no just, um, I can see you. Oh, can you? Okay. Yeah, we can well, see I, you fine. Well, I can't see me. That's why I don't know what you're seeing. Well, just look at yourself. You can see what you can see. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to find. <laughs> that's the book. That, Atlas uh, of the Moon. Locals. Yes. Uh, this is the one that will cost you 150 and up, if you're lucky. Well, yeah, I got mine for 50, but anyway, it, yeah, it's, it's on the... It's a really good search, and I think I got mine for about 100. It's, um, it's out Mike, of print. And then, did you get, Mike, can you unmute? Just a second. Which one do you have, Michael? He's muted. Uh, sorry, yeah. Um, this is a, uh, I think in, this is the Anton, uh, just another edition of, or printing of, of that, the other out of print. Yeah. Um, yeah, it cost me about $100, so I don't recommend this one. But the Charles Wood is $30, so. And, and that's it there. Yeah. yeah. So anyone looking for an atlas, uh, that's what I would recommend for, for a moon god. Yeah. yeah, and I think someone pointed out that they could get the uh, reversed image, mirror image rather, of the uh, sky and telescope map, which folds out into the, the big one. 
and I don't know that one or the other of these is no longer in print. Am I correct in thinking that? Um, I'm not sure. Sometimes it's not, it's hard to get, but I, um, it, 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 it's availability changes, but I, I don't know if it's in, in print or out of print, but. The mirror reversed one's available on Amazon for $330. So I'm guessing that one's the one out of print. Well, that's just, a, that's just one of those ridiculous Amazon things. But <laughs> so one thing I, I've, I have a copy of 21st At century Atlas of the moon and it's good. Um, I want, I once went through it to see if it was a suitable substitute for the Ruko Atlas as far as the um, Isabel Williamson program was concerned. And I concluded that sadly it wasn't. No. It, and the other thing is, um, I mean, it, I don't know if it's been in a second printing or second edition, but I did discover a few, you know, minor errors in the captions and stuff in it. Not, nothing to write home about, but I, I, I did report them to the author. Uh, there used to be a place where you could go and uh, see all of those things, but it disappeared. It was called the Moon Wiki, and it just disappeared off the face of the internet. So I don't know if the uh, Atlas of the Moon has been reprinted, revised in any way. Uh, I still think it's a pretty good book. Um, and, and here's another one that I use. Uh, once I've got my eyes focused on something, um, this one goes into specifics, gives you lat long and all the uh, sub craters within, it gives you a brief description. So you're able to see the details of it. It's all alphabetized, right. it's a beautiful book. And it helped identify some of the things for Elizabeth Williamson in particular. While we're, while we're promoting things, I'm going to hold up some things. Uh, if for the absolute beginner, uh, the. You got to turn off your background, Dave. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? Sorry. Come back down to earth for a moment. Come back to earth. Okay. There I am. You can see my messy room. Uh, so th for the absolute beginner, uh, there is in the Explore the Universe guide, there are some lunar objects. There's 12 craters and 12 Mari for the absolute beginner. So w with the RESC, you can download the Explore the Universe program. It's free. Uh, this book, uh, I think we have a bunch that can sell. I don't know how we give them to people now with what's going on, but you, you, this book is available to help. Um, and it's got a, a specialized map. Um, anyway, um, if you want to do Explore the Universe, Explore the Universe is free. And if you complete it, you'll get a certificate and pin. You don't have to be a member. But we also have the Explore the Universe, uh, ex sorry, Explore the Moon program, both for binocular and telescope. Uh, these things are kind of special edition things that we print up for prizes at Nova East, those things aren't available, but you can get the basic information online at RESC uh, for that. In order to get your certificate and pin, you need to be a member, but you can still download the program. The other thing I'd like to do is, is promote my friend John Reed's book, 50 Things to See on the Moon. John Reed, with a foreword by me, uh, so that was fun to do with John. It was kind of my idea to do it, but he ended up running with it. Uh, and I helped him do that. It's a, a great project uh, for, uh, it's, it's, you know, he's, he selected his own things to highlight and um, talk about. He's got his own style. I had a lot of fun working on him with that, uh, with that, uh, uh, on that with him, sorry. It's getting late. Um, and I wrote the foreword. I, I helped check all of the, the facts and figures in it. So those are some other resources that are available. Dave, you can, uh, if anyone wants a copy of the Explore the Universe, they can, con they can, they can order it through National. They just uh, log on to the RASC. Uh, yes. CA, and um, they can purchase it there. They can and pay the shipping. Uh, I believe you have a bunch of ones in the local area. Four, only four left. Whoa. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, I mean, 
I was hoping that RESE would pick up Explore the Universe and Explore the Moon. Give it no for no. Lost your voice. Nope, you're not coming through it. You're not, not muted. Not here. Yeah, it looks like you unmuted me. How's that? That's better. I guess it, I just took my uh, unplugged my crappy headphones. <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of resources on the moon, and they're all pretty much. Uh, they're not out of date because the moon changes so slowly. <laughs> How's about we go and look at the lunar X again? Okay, give me just one second. I shared the wrong screen. Uh, Try this again. So what happens when you have too many screens open. Um, so that should be, there we go. There's the Lunar X. That's coming along. Yeah, yeah it's just about a full X there now. I dimmed down the display here, by the way, uh, so it's not quite as bright as it was just to get the contrast up. It's filling in a bit more. Yep. So if we sort of. <clears throat> Sometimes the effect is better when you don't zoom in, zoom in so much, right? Yeah. Well, what I'm, what I'm attempting to do here, once I get it centered, there we go. If I lock that, then I can turn that off. Yeah. Now you have the zoomed view here and the zoomed out view here. Yeah. And I turn this down. Uh, I think I have to increase. Give me just a second. I'm just going to pop out to the telescope and increase the exposure simulation there. Uh, it's one of those things I have to do with the camera. Uh, be right back. And the lunar V is still showing in the upper right of the image there. It is. Yep. It is. I noticed that. We still have about two thirds of the people listening that we had when we started. That's pretty good. Okay. Are they all awake? I think I am. Uh, <laughs> not all of us, not all of us. Hey, David Swain. Oh, hi, Wayne. Yeah. yeah. Listen, can you? Uh, Tell me what the difference is uh, between sunlit and shadow on the moon in terms of uh, temperature. Oh gosh, um, I can't answer that off the top of my head. I know that it's very extreme because of the lack of atmosphere, but honestly, I can't. I, I know that um, near the poles of the moon, they they did that. Um, uh, um, spacecraft impact to see if they could stir up some some water ice uh, and I think I think they found that there were some ice and in, and in, in the bottom is of some craters in the moon because it was so darn cold up there but um, sorry I, I don't know that I'd have to look that up but so in, a, in a way, when, when there's no atmosphere, it's hard to say what the temperature is. You know what I mean? It's like, because there's no fluid there to take the temperature of, if you know what I mean. So I don't know how you'd even define the temperature. Uh, Dave, I just Googled it on space.com. It says when the sunlight hits the moon's surface, the temperature can reach 260 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 127 Celsius. And when the sun goes down, temperatures can dip to minus 280 Fahrenheit or minus 173 Celsius. Yeah, well, that's pretty extreme. Yeah. It's about 540 degrees between hot and cold. But, but I, I still question what that means exactly when there's no atmosphere. What does it mean that something is at a high temperature when there's nothing there? 
That sounds like well, the, the, the material. The material would be hot. The surface of the moon, the dust, or the 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 surface of a spacecraft. It's funny, Quinn. I was thinking just when I said that 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 was a question you could answer. Yeah, T temperature has nothing to do with atmosphere. It's, uh, it's well, the absor absor absorption of the heat on the surface. So a black surface, of course, would be a little hotter than a white surface. Yeah. And it says because there's no significant atmosphere in the moon, it can't trap heat or insulate the surface. So that's why the term. I don't know. The universe is a wacky place. Pat Kelly, anyway, is Pat Kelly still there? Um, is Pat Kelly still on? Yeah, I'm still here. Didn't you have a question once in one of those uh, quizzes about what, what is the coldest place in the solar system or the hottest place in the solar system? Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, oh, yeah, I remember because nobody got the answer. Well, what is the answer? It was, it was where, would you, where in the solar system when you find the coldest temperatures. Yes. And the answer was Earth. <laughs> because in research labs, they can get the temperature down to uh, millikelvins. Oh, that's kind of a cheat, though. No, it's just Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in terms of architectural temperatures, though, the, the standard temperature that they used to use for taking outdoor measurements, um, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's basically a thermometer uh, that, is, uh, that has its um, the little mercury and or alcohol in, I guess it is now, inside it was the standard size was about a three centimeter diameter black it looked like a black ping pong ball uh -huh. so, so it, it would it would oh, measure the, the it would measure the temperature uh that, that was one of the standard ways they used for measuring temperature because you couldn't use ground temperature because the ground temperature depended on what what the ground was if you tried putting a using an infrared you know right. one of those little handheld ones you'd get a totally different temperature if you pointed at grass and you would if you pointed at asphalt under the sun, or if you pointed at grass or asphalt in the shade. So the standard way they did was it was, had to be in the sunshine with one of these thermometers that had the little black ball around the end of it. It looks like the seeing is breaking up a bit more, eh, Blair? It is, it's uh, starting to fade a bit. And the X, I've, I've turned the contrast up so you can really begin to see the crater walls here now on the X. So there's one crater right there. The other one is just beginning to come in on that side. I went out to look at the moon and I was surprised at how high it still was. I expected it to be lower in the sky. I was looking for it, I couldn't find it and I looked up and I, <laughs> oh, what are you doing up there? So at this time of year, I guess the first quarter moon is very high in the sky. Uh, Dave, was it you who said earlier in the, uh, in the uh, podcast that if you, if you can't find the moon, you shouldn't call yourself an astronomer. I was, I was beginning to doubt myself, Quinn. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> well, it just goes to show, it doesn't matter how experienced you are, you can always fool yourself. So there, the, uh, the, the lunar X is really starting to show up now. Yes, uh, we're yeah. just waiting for the... Uh, that last vertical face here to become a little bit more illuminated. So, so we're actually watching sunrise in that area now. Yeah, so at the center of the X, there's a little crater, which I, f I don't think even has a name. I, I think it's a, a pity that it doesn't have a name, but I've looked and looked in different atlases and I don't see that it has a name. Not okay. even a, like a, a sub crater of another crater, it just doesn't have a name, period. I think we should remedy that. We need to, we should call it. C Crater Chapman. Well, I'm not sure I like that idea because I think I have to die first. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe we could just call it X. X does mark the spot after all. I don't know, we, maybe we could, is it, who do we go to? The International Astronomical Union? Can we, can we, create a petition or write a letter and say that we should call this crater something. If I go to the trouble to do that, I'm definitely going to put Chapman as the first. <laughs> <laughs> so
see if I can, uh, I don't know how much more magnification that will hold, but there, I think that's the crater you're referring to right it there, is. isn't it? Yeah, it is. The seeing is not quite as good as it was, but it's still pretty good. I mean, this is a zoom in on the uh, camera image of uh, 508%. So, you know, it's about five times what the actual image scale is. And what's there's the, uh, two and a half times Barlow in the optical path. What's, what's the aperture of your scope? The aperture of the scope is about five inches. It's like 4.7. So one of the things that I've noticed about seeing is it, it does depend on the aperture, right? Absolutely. Uh, it it tends to affect it differently depending on the aperture. If the, uh, if the aperture is small, you start to see what we're seeing here. You notice the, the image still remains fairly sharp, but it jumps around. Yeah. If the telescope aperture is large, what happens is rather than jumping around, it tends to just blur out. So this is what I recall from the transit of Venus eight years ago when we went out to Winnipeg. I went out to Winnipeg and so did Roy independently. We both went to Winnipeg because it was cloudy here. We decided to go to Winnipeg. And I brought my little Ranger 70 millimeter and he had this little funky little telescope that was the first telescope he ever owned, which was a 50 millimeter telescope. Very small aperture. And he, he had actually disassembled his telescope, took he took the um, achromatic objective, which is two pieces of glass. He took it apart and sandwich, sandwiched in a mylar film, put it back together. So he, he created a kind of a solar telescope by sandwiching his mylar in his objective. And he took that out. And that's what he was using to look at the transit of Venus. And I had my 70 millimeter. And um, we were noticing that when we looked through our telescopes, we got pretty nice images of the transit of Venus. And then there were all these other people who had like eight and 10 inch telescopes and had these massive filters on them. And he'd go and look at them and, and the image was jumping around all over the place. It was like, Jish, just blah, blah, blah. but with the little tiny telescopes, the image was quite steady. And a number of people came to me and said, the best view of the transit I got was from your telescope. And that guy over there, who is Roy with his 50 millimeter. So the, the small aperture telescopes had the best views because the seeing, the turbulence was so high in the atmosphere. Especially in daytime uh, observing with the sun up and all that heat, it, uh, it sometimes pays to have a small aperture. So that's why these uh, 40 millimeter and smaller and slightly larger telescopes for solar observing are so good. They're, they don't, they don't need to have the aperture. Uh, the aperture doesn't do them any good. That's pretty much true. The, uh, you know, the, you really have to be in an area that has spectacular seeing to take advantage of that kind of aperture. Like a mountaintop. Exactly. So does that relate to the physical size of the turbulence elements in the atmosphere like can you relate the, the like the, the aperture of your scope to the physical size of the eddies in the atmosphere i don't know but i am sure roy will tell us it's in the handbook somewhere <laughs> yeah now you can see the atmosphere is really starting to dance around a bit take a look at the craters yeah. here it's pretty good though. I wasn't, I wasn't very hopeful we'd see much of the X tonight and that's pretty good. Although it is a lot later than we said we'd go. Blair, is there uh, any cloud cover over your way now? Uh, one second. Uh, not that I can see. I'm looking out the window here and the moon is quite prominent and doesn't seem to have any cloud in front of it. Uh, when we zoom out here, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, it doesn't appear to be any cloud. 
Now, oh, okay. as Dave that, said, sometimes when you zoom out, it's easier to see. It's very that obvious. That view there. That reminds me of the time that I saw it for the first time. That that view there. I was, I had my small telescope, and and it was at Nova East, and um, it wasn't quite dark yet. It, the sun had gone down, and the f first quarter moon was in the sky, and I was just you know, setting up my gear and I thought I'd look at the moon and I looked at the moon and I saw that, I saw that X uh, and it just jumped out at me and I was so surprised to see that. Interesting, now you can actually see the V up here and yeah. the up here, here, all in the same view. And it's, f the V, it's filling in around the, uh, the, the light in the background is filling in a bit. Yeah, if we, uh, one second till I pop the magnified view there. Yeah. So here is the V over here. You can see a lot more illumination of the surrounding terrain. Mm -hmm. Or I guess I can't call it terrain. It should be, I don't know what the word is. Because Ter Terra is Earth. Anyway, you know what I mean? Yeah. That's really cool. That's way better than I thought we'd see tonight, Blair. So I'm glad that you were able to show us that. There's another crater, one second. I change where that's centered. Whoops. There we are. What's that crater, Dave? Right. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> this this is the hard. Where, where is it? It's around there? Uh, around well, you can see where my cursor is. Yeah, okay, let me, let me have a right look. There. I have to look at my other screen here. Yeah, the crater is just uh, to the probably about 10 o'clock position from the uh, V shape there. Okay, so, so I'm looking at, hmm, I'm, okay, put me on the spot. I think that's Agrippa, and the one below it is Godin. This guy, which would be yeah. great. Yeah. yeah, and uh, uh, let's see what else is there around there. Yeah, that's um, that's what that is. And above that, yeah, above that, that's where there was rills are supposed to be, but yeah, they're just not showing up. The um, the ones that Judy was talking about, eh? Yeah. Um, oh, wait a second. No. The rime that I was referring to is between Agrippa and Julius. So between, yes. Between like these two. There somewhere. One second. Yeah. So, whoop, there's Julius Caesar. There's Caesar there. And this is the other crater you're talking about here, is it Judy? No. No. Um, the the pair that you were talking about, Blair. No, I was talking about. You said the rills were between Caesar and another crater. Well, Agrippa. We were looking Agrippa. at Agrippa. Go go down to where the pair are down there. It's in between can, there and can Julius. You, can you zoom oh. out? And, uh, Let me see if I can. Can you zoom out a little bit in that part? Zoom out. <laughs> Just a tiny bit. Oh. Yeah. Put oh, those in the lower there. right corner more. It, oh. it is there. No, no, there you go. There you go. Right. It's right there. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah, because where, if you go in the middle, right where your arrow went, right, go up, right there. That's a silver schlag or something like that, that crater. And yeah, the rill is just beside it, so you're, it goes right through where you said it was. Blair. You can see the rill right there. It comes and goes. There's a thin diagonal line there running from about uh, 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock, thereabouts. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Starts about here and runs all the way down to about here. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on the main image here that might 
be a little bit easier, one sec. There we are. Now you, now you can see it in this image, Dave. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you maybe on your screen it shows up with higher resolution than what I can see. Yeah, it's uh, it runs to about here. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. Right, sort of at this mountain right here. Yeah, I'm. I think you must have a better view. Uh, that's quite likely, given that you're looking at it on the uh, other end of whatever compression Zoom uses. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be really interested. Uh, can you try to take a still a picture? Uh, I changed the camera settings, so let's see. I don't know if I can without going out and. But it's okay changing the setting again, but it is definitely right there. I can, I can make out the rill without too much difficulty. It's yeah. coming and going, uh, as the seeing distorts it, but when the seeing stabilizes, you can definitely make it out. I can't, I can't see it. I don't know if anyone else can. I can't see it. It's just, it, the seeing is getting really crappy now. Yeah, yeah. it all depends on uh, where the seeing is. It, there are times when you can't see, and then other times you can see it, it's it's there. There's no question. Okay. Well, I I haven't been able to see it. One second here. Uh, I'm just trying to move it back down maybe, towards. The maybe center. once in a while there is a bit of a like a hairline that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe once in a while. The, the seeing is getting worse and worse in that area. This is crazy. What I should really do is get a telescope and go out and look at it. <laughs> but you can stay inside and drink coffee this way. Coffee? <laughs> You're an astronomer after all. There you are. Now, now you should be able to see it, Dave. Uh, only because you're suggesting it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't jump out at me. It runs from about here. Yeah, yeah, I know where it's supposed to be. To the top of the crater down to about here from the looks of it. There's somebody's asking a bunch of questions here. Um, people are thanking us. Um, Brad is asking, would, would such turbulence make deep sky objects difficult to see? Uh, uh, my answer is that uh, on surficially no, because it's, because you're basically looking at a fuzzy object. Uh, but when you get to the details of the fuzzy object, yes. I mean, but most people, if you're just looking for a blob, you'll probably detect it, no problem. But if you're looking for any kind of uh, details in the deep sky object, which experienced observers would see, um, that seeing would affect that. Uh, I, I'm convincing myself I'm seeing that now, Blair, uh, looking at it. Yeah, it's definitely there. But if you hadn't have told me it was there, I don't think I would have noticed it. <laughs> yeah, well, like, like I said, you're on the other end of whatever compression Zoom is using. Uh, it's yeah. quite a spot right now on my screen. Okay, so to further the question about the turbulence, about, he was asking something like M51, would it affect it? Um, well, it, could, it depends again. I think it depends on what, to what degree. Uh, you know, uh, it's a hard question to answer because, you, I mean, superficially, not much, but as terms of detail, M51 is the whirlpool, right? M51 is the whirlpool, but visually, you would never know it simply because visually, M51 is a fuzzy blob. Uh, yeah. Just like every other galaxy is a fuzzy blob. Uh, <laughs> I think, however, would be another matter. Uh, you would notice the, uh, the the soft seeing tonight if you were taking images. The Six. sort of AJ regions in the galaxy would not stand out nearly as well as they would on a nice crisp night. Yeah, I think that amongst visual observers, there the, are those that train themselves to see these kinds of features. It, it takes a lot of experience. Aperture doesn't hurt either. No, but I typically I haven't heard uh, deep sky type observers say too much about seeing um, 
they're more they're more concerned about transparency i think yeah exactly uh, the the reason is of course that the light levels are so low yeah that, uh you, you don't use your color receptors and the uh the, the nighttime vision is not very acute to begin with so there was a guy from Taiwan who applied for the Deep Sky Challenge uh, certificate, which is uh, very difficult. It's like the most difficult thing we have. And he, um, people were in the committee were very skeptical at first because he, he wasn't using big enough telescopes. He was like using five and six inch refractors and um but he had these like super high-end refractors really good optics but the other thing was he was going he was going <coughs> to the top of some mountain in taiwan in a in a dark area and he was getting really good results and he was drawing what he saw so in the end people always said well you know uh, we have to give him we have to give him the certificate because he's drawn what he's seen and uh it's incomprehensible to us here in Canada that you could see anything like that without having a big Dobsonian reflector. But in the end, they they had to admit that he had done the job, you know. So there's a lot of a lot of factors that involve involved in picking things out. Absolutely. Uh, if you, if you take a look now, uh, I'm going to have to shut things down here in a few minutes, but. Yeah. Uh, that's probably about the most we're going to see of the Lunar X. We're probably about an hour away from when it becomes very prominent and bright. Yes. Then I, after that, it's going to start to sort of fill in and you begin to see the craters. Well, I think the it's getting lower in the sky and the, the seeing is, we're losing the seeing and you might even hit your horizon pretty soon. I don't know, but uh, anyway. Yeah. I'm That's pretty good. That's better than I thought we were going to be able to see. So I'm I'm satisfied. Yeah, no, I think it went reasonably well, especially the way it started at seven with uh, no network connection and uh, <laughs> panic. But other than that, so so yeah, I mean, um, if you want to, if you feel like you need to shut down, I think I think everybody's satisfied. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, I am going to uh, go and try and grab a few hours of sleep and be ready for a meeting uh, early tomorrow morning. Well, thanks, Blair. Let's you know, let's plan on doing this again. I've I find it very satisfactory, very helpful, and uh, entertaining. And people seem to we, we kept people's attention for quite a long time, so I think it was a big success. Well, what I would suggest is, uh, Dave, between you and I, uh, let's sort of do one of these uh, again when the sort of next group of uh, interesting things becomes visible on the moon. Uh, unfortunately, we have to fit it in with where the moon is in my sky. So by the time it gets closer to full, we really probably couldn't start until around 10 o'clock uh, simply because it won't be clear of my neighbor's house until then. Well, there's but, the weather too. I would say that uh, an interesting time to try for would be around the time you can see Copernicus. Okay. Which is like a gibbous phase. So it's, you know, I don't know how many days from now it would be. The full moon is on May the 7th. Um, uh, uh, you know, if it's not too soon, we could think about early, early next week, but, um, we'll, we'll see how it looks. I'll have to take a look and see what the altitude would be when, yep. uh, and, uh, because I, I do have this problem where the neighbor's house is right in the way and it just simply doesn't climb enough, but, uh, we'll sort that out and, uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go and wheel the telescope in the garage and uh, hit the sack for the evening. And as I said, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and uh, certainly you for being the MC and Judy for setting it all up for us. Well, it was, uh, I think you did the most work because you had to do the physical setup, but uh, I'm happy to uh, be the navigator. So it was fun. We'll do it again. No problem.
Good night, everybody. Night.